I never thought I would experience something as terrifying as this in my entire life. And, at the risk of sounding like a cliché, it changed me forever. My name is Harold Pearson, and up until that fateful night, I was just your average truck driver making deliveries across the United States. I have a wife, two kids, and a dog named Sparky back home. I'm not what you'd call a superstitious person. I never really believed in ghosts, monsters, or any of that kind of stuff. I was making my way through Idaho, heading towards Boise, with a shipment of electronics that were due that day. The sun had long since set, and I found myself driving along one of those long stretches of highway that seemed to stretch out into infinity. Somewhere, deep down inside me, I whispered that something was off, but at the time, it seemed like any other delivery run. Things took a turn for the worse when the engine under my rig decided to act up. Steam billowed from beneath the hood as the truck rolled to an uneasy stop on the shoulder of the road. With a defeated sigh, I grabbed my phone and called in for help. Hey Mike, I said into the phone once my boss picked up on the other end. My rig's acting up again. Think you can send someone out here to take a look? No problem, replied Mike. But it might take a bit longer than usual since we don't have anyone nearby. That's fine, I sighed. Just please hurry. With nothing else to do but wait for assistance, I decided to step out of my rig to stretch my legs and get some fresh air. As soon as my feet hit the pavement, I noticed an eerie silence had fallen over the area, even for being on such an isolated stretch of highway. It was unnervingly quiet. Suddenly aware of my surroundings, I began to notice a putrid smell creeping into the air. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced, a heavy, sickening odor that seemed to suffocate me. As I fought the urge to gag, my eyes caught sight of a figure emerging from the shadows a short distance away. The person, if you could even call it that, was abnormally tall and slim, bathed in moonlight its body covered in what looked like rags, and hunched forward in an unnatural way. As it drew closer, I realized its face was obscured by a matted mess of hair that stuck to its skin like glue. Ah, hey there, I stammered, trying to force out some semblance of natural conversation despite my rising panic. You need something? It didn't respond with words. Instead, it slowly raised one of its long limbs and pointed at my truck, specifically the back. Like a moth drawn to a flame, I found myself inexplicably walking to the rear of my rig. To my horror, as I opened the truck's doors for whatever reason compelled me to do so, I discovered the gruesome remains of some unfortunate souls inside. Shaking uncontrollably now and unable to comprehend what lay before me, unbearable fear washed over me as I glanced back at that monstrous figure lurking nearby. In its eyes was an indescribable malice, as if it were daring me to scream. And scream I did. Somewhere along that desolate highway in Idaho, help arrived only moments later, responding to my desperate cries for help. I stood motionless, my breath stuck in my throat, staring at the mutilated bodies that lay amongst the electronics in my rig. The figure sauntered closer as terror gripped me from within. Desperate to escape this wicked nightmare, I instinctively reached for my phone to call for help once more. However, just as I lifted the phone to my ear, I caught a glimpse of the figure's eyes, cold, calculating, and devoid of any humanity. A single moment of paralysis was enough. I knew that trying to call someone now would only aggravate it further. My only chance of survival lay in discovering its motivations and reasoning with it, 
But how could I reason with a monster? As a horrific realization hit me, I began recounting the events that led me here. There had been nothing out of the ordinary about this shipment. It was merely electronics bound for Boise. These dead people must have had something valuable that attracted the attention of this monstrous being. After all, it didn't seem interested in harming me yet. It focused solely on what lay inside the rig. Gathering up whatever courage still remained inside me, I mustered up all my strength and stood tall. What do you want? I addressed the figure tremblingly. The entity didn't answer directly. Instead, it moved toward one of the lifeless bodies and removed something from its grasp, a tiny USB drive gleaming in the moonlight. Suddenly, shuffling footsteps echoed down the road as a man approached us warily. Hey! Are you guys okay? He yelled from afar. The figure flinched at his voice and retreated into the shadows. In that fleeting moment, as if guided by some divine luck, I recognized the tattoo on the figure's wrist, one that belonged to a notorious criminal named Randall Jameson, who had been on local law enforcement's radar for months. My God, whispered the stranger, observing the horrific scene as he grew closer. We need to call the police right now. They won't get here in time, I admitted, scared for our lives. He's still nearby, and he's dangerous. The man nodded, and without wasting any time, he dashed back to his car to retrieve a shotgun he kept for protection. Together, we returned to my rig. I felt a smidge of confidence with the armed stranger by my side. As we cautiously scanned the area, we discovered a trail of blood leading away from the truck toward an abandoned barn. We followed it cautiously, ready for whatever might emerge from beyond that dilapidated structure, and yelled out a warning before entering. We know who you are, Randall! I shouted confidently, hoping to unnerve him. Give up now! There's nowhere left for you to hide. In response, we heard panicked footfalls making their way toward the rear of the barn. I braced myself for what lurked ahead, a deadly confrontation with Randall Jameson himself. Just as Randall emerged from hiding in the open space beyond the barn, the stranger fired his shotgun at him. The shot narrowly missed its target. Visibly shaken and realizing that we were now determined adversaries, Randall vanished into the night. The stranger and I exchanged glances before sighing in relief. Our lives had been spared tonight. But even as we called the police and reported our harrowing experience, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. I knew that this wasn't over. Randall would return one day to claim what he believed was rightfully his. We had managed to escape his sinister grasp for now, but who knew what terrifying methods he would resort to next time? As I drove away from that desolate highway in Idaho, leaving behind a trail of death and terror in that place I hoped to never see again, somewhere deep within the bowels of darkness, Randall Jameson continued to lurk unseen, biding his time, waiting for the perfect moment to strike again. The rumble of my truck's engine mixed with the sound of tires crunching on gravel as I pulled up to the isolated gas station. My name's Tobias Wayne, and I've been a truck driver for the last 15 years. It was a lonely job, but it paid well, and I had some interesting stopovers at times. I wiped the sweat from my brow and stepped out into the deserted parking lot. Stretching my sore muscles with a heavy sigh, I decided to grab something to eat and take a break before hitting the road again. The gas station was nestled in a dense forest in Wisconsin, and as beautiful as it was, something seemed off about this place. 
As I turned to walk towards the gas station store, I noticed a teenager sitting on a bench outside. His expression was lifeless, almost disinterested, as he chewed on his hamburger. Hey there, I said, greeting him with a friendly nod. How's your day treating you? He looked up from his meal, and a faint smile crossed his lips. Not too good, he confessed. My favorite jacket got caught in the doors at school today. I ripped it to shreds. I replied with mock horror. No, not the jacket. Does it have any last requests for us to follow through? He chuckled ever so slightly before his gaze dropped back down at his burger. Shaking his head dismissively, he replied, Guess not. After some awkward silence between us, I asked if anything weird or creepy had happened around here lately. Again, that distant look flickered across his face as if his mind went elsewhere for a brief moment before returning to reality. He dismissed my question with an apathetic grunt before continuing to consume his meal in silence. Feeling slightly unnerved by our conversation, or lack thereof, I grabbed myself some snacks and coffee before heading back to my truck's cab. Just as I was about to climb in, a chilling scream pierced the air. I spun around, heart pounding, and saw a group of girls by their car, screaming at the sight of blood splattered across their windshield and a faint outline of an unfamiliar face smeared into a grotesque figure. My lunch immediately lost its place, causing me to feel distressed. As I took a few cautious steps closer, it was clear that whoever had done this was incredibly brutal in their actions. The girls were trembling and sobbing wildly when I reached them. Offering what comfort I could provide under the circumstances, I assured them that we needed to report this and get some help. We walked into the store together, trying not to look back at the grisly sight outside. Thankfully, the attendant behind the counter had already called in about what had happened when they'd heard the screams. In the midst of our distress, a figure emerged from the shadows, tall, thin, but insanely muscular with penetrating eyes and an unsettling grin that showcased cracked, yellow teeth stained with blood. The teenager from before glared at us with a fury that sent chills down my spine as he slammed his fist onto one of the gas pumps outside. We tried to hold it together as panic threatened to overtake us, reminding each other of how we were stronger now that we were together. We huddled in fear as the terrifying figure approached us, his warped face becoming more visible under the harsh fluorescent lighting. Losing all logic as dread coursed through our veins, we began to argue amongst ourselves whether calling out for help would be useless or not. Time seemed to stretch on endlessly as fear flooded our systems, making it impossible for rational thought or even coherent sentences. Our hands shook against our skin as hot tears streamed down our faces while the murderous figure stepped closer and closer. As I fumbled for my phone, the other girls and I exchanged looks filled with horror. It was becoming abundantly clear that we needed help, and fast. The police were still on their way, but we knew they wouldn't arrive in time to save us from our imminent doom. I finally managed to grab my phone, but as I unlocked it and began dialing 911, the menacing figure moved so fast that he swiped it straight out of my hands. He then crushed it under his boot with a smirk on his face. Our chances of calling anybody for assistance were now gone, and we knew we had to find another way out of this situation. We decided as a group to make our way back to our vehicles in hopes that we could outmaneuver him if his focus was split amongst us all. The forest surrounding us seemed to close in more tightly as we prepared for the confrontation. We knew it was do or die at this point, 
and were determined not to become victims ourselves. We split up, each heading towards a different vehicle. As chaotic as the moment was, one couldn't help but notice how eerily quiet the environment had become. Suddenly, a terrible scream rang out behind me. One girl wasn't fast enough. Her body lay lifeless on the ground, strangled to death by her own seatbelt. The figure seemed to possess unbelievable strength and cunning as he efficiently moved between us, making targets out of each of us simultaneously. In desperation, I got into my truck and started the engine with trembling hands. He glared at me intensely as he stalked closer and closer to my truck when two other girls reached their cars and began shouting at him to divert his attention away from me. In that brief moment, I spotted a security guard running toward the commotion. As he approached the scene, he cautiously examined what was happening before stepping in and attempting to restrain the cruel figure. But the attacker seemed unfazed, effortlessly twisting free of the guard's grip and launching him into a nearby tree, which he collided with violently, ending his life in an instant. The attacker then turned his attention back to us, his determination strengthened by the failed intervention. As he neared my truck, I noticed a name tag attached to his blood-stained shirt. Malcolm. He must have been an employee here at one point. Perhaps this place had driven him to madness. He pulled a previously hidden knife from his belt, its scintillating edge gleaming under the dim lights. It was time to act. In a final act of self-preservation, I slammed on the gas pedal and aimed my truck straight at Malcolm, hoping that even if he dodged, it would buy me enough time to escape. The sound of tires screeching against the pavement echoed through the night as I drove off, my heart pounding in my chest. In my rearview mirror, I saw the nightmarish figure of Malcolm leaping out of my truck's path with incredible agility and landing back on his feet. The demented grin that spread across his face as he watched me drive away was something I'd never forget. It was as though he got some perverse enjoyment from our terror. As I sped down the road towards the distant promise of safety, those left behind at the gas station haunted my thoughts. The whispers of the lives taken that horrific night would forever plague me. I could only hope that this wasn't an ending but rather just a piece in Malcolm's terror-filled puzzle, and that someday someone would figure out how to stop him for good. Until then, I needed to keep moving forward, but I knew that Malcolm's sinister shadow would always loom over me, threatening my peace and sanity. When I got the call, I knew it was my brother, Clovis Whitley. He was in trouble again. It seemed he had a knack for finding himself in sticky situations. As a seasoned truck driver navigating the vast networks of roads across the United States, I'd had my fair share of bizarre encounters, but nothing could have prepared me for what awaited me in Lower Manhattan. I arrived at the specified location, an inconspicuous alleyway between two gritty brick buildings. The smell was that of greasy food and diesel fumes. I looked around hesitantly before making my way down the narrow path. Hey! Clovis! I called out, trying to keep the worry out of my voice. My words echoed off the walls. I heard a snicker from a nearby trash can and tensed up, my palms beginning to sweat. It's about time, Orson! There he stood, Clovis in all his disheveled glory. He wore a faded plaid shirt speckled with blood, half tucked into equally dirty jeans. His face was streaked with grime and sweat. All right, he sighed dramatically. I need your help. What happened? 
I asked, trying to sound calm as my anxiety grew. Clovis proceeded to tell me about an ominous-looking man he'd seen lurking around the neighborhood for weeks now. While this mysterious figure gave him an uneasy feeling, he couldn't put his finger on exactly why. This part of New York City had plenty of shady characters drifting through. It all changed when a local delivery man vanished without a trace. At first dismissed as accidental or self-inflicted harm, that was until a shredded uniform and ominous puddles of blood appeared in an abandoned subway tunnel nearby. The revelation sent shivers down my spine, and suddenly I understood why Clovis had reached out to me specifically. Someone needed to step in and make sense of this escalating nightmare. It's like he's toying with us. Clovis muttered under his breath, echoing my thoughts. Mutilating the evidence. Our conversation was cut short by the faint sound of footsteps echoing from the depths of the alley. We exchanged nervous glances before ducking behind a nearby dumpster. There, not ten feet from us, stood a man who fit my brother's description perfectly, tall and lanky with disheveled hair and unnervingly wild eyes that seemed to gleam beneath the dim light cast by a flickering street lamp. He was dressed in dark clothes stained crimson, which sent chills down my spine as I realized what they resembled. We watched in horror as he pulled a long, serrated knife from his belt and began to skulk around the alley like a predator surveying its territory. This was our chance to act, to stop him before he inflicted harm on any more innocent people. I turned to Clovis, my brain scrambling for some kind of plan. What if you go out there? I suggested hesitantly and tried to catch his attention while I sneak up on him from behind? But what if? Clovis started, but I cut him off with a determined glare. We don't have time for what ifs. We need to act now. Clovis reluctantly nodded and pushed himself away from the dumpster. Slowly he crept into view, using his skill and stealth that I'd always found unsettling but now found invaluable. Before any of us could react or implement our plan, the mysterious figure slashed at Clovis ferociously with his wicked blade. In a flash, Clovis maneuvered to sidestep the knife, narrowly avoiding the lethal blow. The serrated weapon sliced through the air as the attacker stumbled forward. Seizing the opportunity, I sprinted towards the assailant putting all my weight behind a powerful shoulder charge that sent him sprawling onto the ground. Run, Clovis! I shouted, urging my brother to flee while I tried to keep the dangerous man pinned. The attacker squirmed beneath me, kicking and twisting in an effort to break free. My strength was rapidly waning, making it evident that we needed help. However, there were no nearby pedestrians or neighbors due to the alley's secluded nature. Seeing an opening, the attacker slammed his elbow into my face, causing me to lose my grip and fall off of him. He rose to his feet and fixed those wild eyes on us once more as we scrambled to get up. Clovis and I had no choice but to retreat sprinting down the alley as fast as our legs would carry us. We knew we couldn't outrun him for long without proper backup. At a safe distance from our pursuer, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911 while Clovis kept an eye out for any signs of imminent danger. As we waited for the police, a local resident named Sophia approached us cautiously. Recognizing that we were strangers in distress and in need of assistance, she explained that she had been observing this mysterious individual for days now. His name was Red Death Chain. A man with a violent past is known for brutal attacks on unsuspecting victims. He had managed to evade capture countless times before because of his cunning nature and deep understanding of how to avoid leaving incriminating evidence. 
With that information in mind, we resolved to confront Rhett one last time before leaving it up to law enforcement. We carefully retraced our steps back towards his original position, only to find the alleyway bathed in an eerie darkness. Rhett was nowhere to be seen. Feeling uneasy about the situation, we chose not to further engage him on our own. We relayed all the information we gathered to the police and informed them of Rhett's horrifying actions. As we stood there, a blood-curdling scream echoed from a neighboring alleyway, a horrifying reminder of Rhett's ability to strike fear into us. Despite our best efforts and intentions to end his terror, he had managed yet again to slip through our fingers. Knowing Rhett would likely remain a menacing presence lurking in the shadows of Lower Manhattan, we felt a sense of defeat that would linger indefinitely. With each passing day, we couldn't help but think about his victims, forever scarred by his brutal attacks. Though Rhett continued his twisted game of cat and mouse with authorities, life awaited us outside this grisly tale. We held on to a small glimmer of hope that one day he would finally meet his match and be brought to justice for the pain and anguish he inflicted upon so many innocent people. But until that day came, the chilling thought of Rhett Deschain's presence would haunt the streets of Lower Manhattan, an unyielding reminder that danger could strike at any moment for those who stumbled into his path. It was a muggy Tuesday evening, and my buddy Mark, also a truck driver, and I were sharing stories over coffee at a greasy spoon diner. As we laughed at our past blunders and near misses, the conversation took a darker turn when a gruff-looking man with a scarred face burst through the door. He glanced around the room with eyes that seemed to pierce through your soul, sending an unwelcome chill down my spine. Hey, have you ever heard of the blood painter? I asked Mark nervously, trying to distract from the sinister aura this newcomer brought with him. Mark leaned in closer, lowering his voice. I've only heard whispers about him, man. They say he's a serial killer who leaves grotesque paintings behind at his scenes using the blood of his victims. As we spoke, the stranger got up from his seat and sauntered towards us. Sweat beaded on my forehead as my heart rate quickened. We made small talk as usual but couldn't shake those eerie feelings. Just then, ten minutes into our conversation with this stranger who called himself Kurt Winters, we heard a scream from outside the diner. We all rushed towards the commotion only to find ourselves staring in horror at what was left of a body lying in the middle of the parking lot. The victim's blood had been spread across the asphalt like some sick modern art piece. What? What is that? I stammered as bile rose in my throat. Kurt clenched his fists and muttered something under his breath before quickly pulling out his phone to call for help. As I tried dialing 911, I noticed my hands shook uncontrollably. The police quickly arrived on scene along with an ambulance, although it was obvious that any help was futile for the poor soul sprawled across the pavement. The officers questioned each of us separately but were unable to gather any pertinent information. With a heavy heart, I returned to my truck unable to process what had just transpired. As Mark and I parted ways that night, we couldn't help but think of the coincidence. The scarred man, the blood painter, was Kurt somehow involved in this gruesome crime? He'd fled the scene shortly after giving his statement, and our suspicions grew. A few days later, I received a call from Mark asking to meet up. We sat together at another small-town diner further down the interstate. As we sipped burnt coffee in silence, 
Mark revealed that he'd been contacted by someone who claimed they knew who the blood painter was, and that person was none other than our mysterious new acquaintance, Kurt Winters. Stunned by this revelation, we debated what to do next. We couldn't just sit back and do nothing, knowing lives were at stake. But how could we even begin to prove such a claim? Were we ready for the consequences? While either of us said it out loud, we both knew deep down that some dark part of us wanted to see what Kurt was truly capable of doing and whether there were more cryptic, blood-stained masterpieces waiting for us. As we pondered our next steps, neither of us could shake the feeling that someone was watching us, perhaps stalking through our shadows like a predatory cat. Was it possible that our suspicions alerted Kurt? We have to alert the police, I whispered anxiously to Mark. But as soon as those words left my mouth, I noticed movement behind Mark's shoulder in the windowpane reflection, something shiny catching my eye from outside. I quickly alerted Mark to the movement outside, and we both cautiously exited the diner. Our eyes searched for any signs of trouble, but the parking lot was dimly lit and eerily quiet. We split up with cautious steps, hoping to find a clue that would lead us to the source of the menace. Out of nowhere, a person with a hooded jacket stealthily appeared behind Mark, holding a knife with a serrated edge. Mark must have sensed danger, as he quickly spun around and narrowly avoided being stabbed. The attacker dodged Mark's attempt at self-defense and sliced his forearm, drawing blood. I rushed to assist my friend, grabbing a metal rod on the ground nearby. With a swing fueled by sheer determination, I managed to hit the hooded figure square in the chest. They stumbled back in pain but recovered quickly, disappearing into the shadows. Mark felt weak from his injury, so I called 911 and requested assistance. The police arrived shortly after, asking questions while paramedics patched up Mark's wound. We described the hooded person and their gruesome attack but were unable to provide any solid leads regarding their identity or motives. After being discharged from the hospital, we spoke with an informant who operated under the name Watchdog. He revealed what seemed like an impossible truth that our suspected antagonist was Kurt Winters himself. Kurt was known for his seemingly ordinary life as a salesman but held dark and disturbing secrets beneath, leading him to carry out these horrifying acts as the blood painter. Tormented by fear and responsibility for those who might suffer at Kurt's hands, we decided it was time to try stopping him once and for all. For the next few days, taking turns ensured that one of us always kept watch on Kurt under the guise of catching up after work. Our suspicions grew heavier when we found pieces of evidence connected to Kurt's horrific crimes in his apartment, bloody clothes and tools that were unmistakably those of the blood painter. It was time to act. We developed a plan to confront Kurt, armed with our collected evidence and demanded an explanation for his actions. We followed him to a secluded area where we believed he planned to meet his next victim, our hearts beating with a mix of dread and resolve. Just as we cornered Kurt, flashes of blue and red lights flooded the scene. The police had been called by Watchdog, who had been monitoring our movements and realizing our intentions. They approached with caution guns drawn. Instead of attempting to capture or kill Kurt, as we anticipated, the officers surrounded him without causing any harm. In a twist we never saw coming, it turned out that Kurt was actually working undercover as an informant for the police, infiltrating the group of bloodthirsty killers who called themselves the Blood Painters. Kurt revealed that he discovered their leader's identity and motives along with the locations of various targeted victims. 
He shared that he'd intended to call for backup when we first encountered him at the diner but decided against it to maintain his cover. With the blood painters now being hunted by police officials worldwide, we could only hope their gruesome terror would soon come to an end. As for us, Mark and I chose not to further involve ourselves in this nightmare, grateful that our lives had not yet joined those of the blood painter's many victims. And yet, even as we tried moving on with our lives, there remained a troubling question. If Kurt could assume such an identity and deceive us so convincingly, could there be others like him? Wearing masks that hide monsters beneath? And how many more souls would they claim before we saw their true faces? I've been driving trucks for the last 18 years, but what I'm about to share is an experience so harrowing that even my therapist still hasn't heard this story. It was a rather nondescript evening as I steered my big rig into Lebanon, Oregon. The dull skies mirrored my monotonous yet dependable routine. My truck's radio crackled with the sound of steel guitar from an old country song, as if setting the stage for the terror ahead. The next pickup point led me down a less traveled road alongside a dense forest. My instincts told me something was off. But, like most seasoned truckers, I brushed it off as paranoia and kept driving. A large pothole jolted me back to reality. As I struggled to regain control of the rig, I noticed a car parked haphazardly off the side of the road, its blinkers flashing desperately. Deducing there might be someone in trouble, I decided to help out, a decision I'd come to regret. Approaching cautiously, I peered into the car's window but found no one inside. Then suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the silence. My heart thudded in my chest as my adrenaline surged. This is no place to be alone. Heavy breathing emerged from behind me. Right at that moment, an ice-cold hand clamped tightly around my wrist. My body froze in terror. And before I could react to a call for help, another chilling scream echoed through the woods. I yanked my arm free and spun around only to face pure, unadulterated horror standing before me, inexplicably human yet so wrong on every level. He had bulging eyes that stared right through me and wore a mask of grotesque flesh sewn haphazardly together. His morbid appearance struck fear deep into my soul. A sick laugh bubbled up from the abomination as he reached for me again, this time with blood-soaked fingers clutching a dreadful tool meant for unspeakable acts. I knew I couldn't outrun this monster, but my survival instincts spurred me to resist. With a swift kick, I caught him off guard and disarmed him. The agony on his twisted face only lasted a moment. I braced myself for retaliation, but he slipped away into the shadows of the sinister woods, taking the heart-wrenching screams with him. A maniacal laugh echoed throughout the night, and in that moment, I knew the roadside horror wouldn't be leaving me any time soon. Wounded and overwhelmed with terror, I limped back to my idling truck. I had no choice but to finish my route and leave this grisly nightmare behind. Every nerve in my body screamed to call for help. However, years on the road had taught me that help almost never comes fast enough. Clutching tightly onto the steering wheel, blood oozing from my throbbing arm, I've never felt so vulnerable in all my years driving big rigs despite feeling relatively safe within my metal sanctuary. I knew I needed to alert someone about this horrifying man, but I couldn't simply call the police and report a monster without substantial proof. I decided to instead reach out to a trusted friend and fellow trucker, Jim, who frequented the same roads and often had odd encounters. 
After patching through our radio channels, we were connected. Jim, it's me, I rasped. I need your help. I've just encountered something terrible. Terrible? What are you talking about? Jim replied, his voice laced with concern as he grasped the seriousness in my tone. Describing the gruesome encounter with the human abomination, I urged Jim to meet up at a diner near Lebanon so we could discuss what to do next. As I headed toward the meeting point, my mind raced with fear and confusion. At the diner, Jim listened intently as I recounted my awful experience. His face paled with every descriptive detail. It sounds like you've come across Roland Sims. Jim hesitated. He was once a respected surgeon until an obsession with immortality led him down a dark path, performing horrifying experiments on unwilling patients. He's been eluding authorities ever since hiding out in rural areas wearing that mask of flesh. I pondered over this revelation. That possessed individual was once renowned in his field but had succumbed to his twisted desires. Roland haunted these roads, waiting for vulnerable souls like me. As we strategized on how to inform the authorities without coming off as delusional or unreliable witnesses, we scanned local news articles for similar encounters or possible victims of Roland. Jim continued pulling at threads until we landed on a recent article detailing several disappearances along these quiet roads near Lebanon. Fearful for anyone else caught in Roland's diabolical clutches, we decided it was time for action. Armed with evidence supporting these gruesome claims and bolstered by my traumatic encounter, we agreed that notifying the police was crucial. Despite the bizarre nature of this tale, we contacted local law enforcement, detailing our findings and urging them to investigate further. Once satisfied with the police's commitment to searching for Roland, I continued onward as a trucker, ever vigilant, while traversing these desolate Oregon roads. Although it seemed naive to hope Roland would face justice, the sustained effort to bring awareness to this malevolent force at least offered some semblance of control. And so went the days following my harrowing encounter, with every mile driven bringing a renewed appreciation for subtly maintaining security against evils lurking on seemingly mundane roads. As night fell once again, I parked my truck at a rest stop, my mind consumed with thoughts of Roland and his grotesque presence. Glancing around the shadow-laden area, I couldn't help but worry if another poor soul might suffer at his blood-soaked hands. As I began to doze off within my cab, I heard a faint scratching noise. My body tensed as I scanned the darkness. Disturbing memories flashed within my mind. Was it Roland? Had he returned to haunt me? Resisting the urge to remain paralyzed in fear and reviving my survival instincts, I cautiously exited the cab. If evil continued its awful campaign here tonight or anywhere else, I wouldn't cower away. Peering into the shadows revealed nothing sinister, merely tree branches brushing against the side of my truck. Relief coursed through me but left behind an unsettling reality. Occasionally, we are faced with genuine horrors without certain resolution. Roland's twisted deeds might never meet their reckoning, but as long as there are those willing to confront and expose evils, however gruesome, hope remains. Only then can light dispel those insidious shadows hiding true malevolence. I was cruising down I-40 in North Carolina, the hum of my truck singing along with the radio. My name is Daryl Reinhardt, and I've been a truck driver for about 20 years now. It's not the most glamorous job, but it's provided a decent living for my family. 
I like to joke that in an alternate universe, I might have been a stand-up comedian. But in this one, I'm just a stand-up guy always ready with a wise crack or two. It had been an uneventful trip so far, delivering goods from Knoxville, Tennessee, to Raleigh, North Carolina. The sun had long set, and the darkness outside was illuminated by only the headlights of my truck and passing vehicles. There wasn't much in the way of traffic tonight, just a few cars sprinkled along the interstate. As I approached a rest stop near Greensboro, my stomach started to grumble. Deciding to take a break and grab something at the vending machines, I pulled off into the partially filled parking lot. A few other truckers were around, some chatting near their rigs while others simply enjoyed some good old-fashioned peace and quiet. I hopped out of my truck and rummaged for change inside my pocket while walking towards the vending machines. My eyes inadvertently scanned the vicinity. You never know when some ill-intended stranger might make their move in these secluded parts. As I fumbled with my dollar bill and stared down at various snack options before me, I noticed something oddly out of place reflected in the machine's glass surface. Near an old pickup truck behind me was someone standing completely still, shrouded in darkness. At first glance, it seemed harmless. Maybe someone was just enjoying a smoke break. One thing was unnerving about this individual. Their heads seemed to be cocked to one side at an uncomfortable angle. Suddenly they shifted positions, silently but fast, like a predator honing in on its prey. It was subtle enough that I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. After all, nothing scarier than a restless imagination. I grabbed my chocolate bar and chuckled to myself, cracking a joke in my head about the mage of the vending machine. But as I turned around and started heading back to my truck, I could sense this mysterious person following me. I glanced back nervously, trying to make out any features or intentions behind their shadowy form. All I could discern was that they were dressed in some sort of long black coat, with their chins barely illuminated by the dim parking lot lights. Picking up my pace back to my truck, the unnerving presence continued its pursuit, maintaining an eerily constant distance just outside my peripheral vision. My nerves frayed further with every step. Questions and doubts multiplied in my head as I considered whether it would be better to confront this person or try to avoid them altogether. As I approached my truck cab door, I broke into a jog and reached for the handle. Instead of gripping cold metal, however, my fingers found themselves wrapped around another hand. The sensation sent shivers through my body. It was damp and veiny and completely unexpected. In that split second before panic settled in, my eyes tracked up the arm connected to the hand and into the beady eyes of the black-coated figure. Silently, we remained locked in this macabre greeting for what felt like an eternity. As soon as I could react, I yanked my hand away from the stranger's grip and took several steps back, trying to maintain distance. My mind raced, struggling to make sense of the situation. The mysterious stranger didn't move, their head was still tilted at an unnatural angle, and their face was hidden in the shadows. My initial instinct was to call for help, but the nearest truckers were too far away to hear a shout, and it would be too dangerous to turn my back on this person and run toward them. Instead, I cautiously fumbled for my phone, ready to call 911 if needed. Just as I was about to make the call, another trucker approached us, seemingly unaware of the tense confrontation unfolding before him. He walked up to the stranger and spoke with familiarity. Hey there, Mark, he said jokingly. I haven't seen you around in a while. How've you been? The stranger, now identified as Mark, 
straightened his head and replied in a raspy voice, Been busy. His face remained hidden by shadows. Before I could question further, Mark abruptly turned around and walked away into the darkness without another word. The trucker who had spoken with him shrugged off the odd encounter and carried on. Hesitant to leave but not wanting to engage with Mark further, I quickly returned to my truck and locked the door behind me. I stayed awake that night, keeping an eye out for any sign of Mark stalking around my rig, but saw nothing more of him. In the morning, before leaving the rest stop, I tracked down the trucker who had spoken with Mark last night out of curiosity. It couldn't hurt to know more about this mysterious figure. Ah, Mark Reinhold, he sighed when I asked him about their conversation last night. He has quite a reputation around these parts. What kind of reputation? I asked cautiously. The trucker leaned in and whispered. He's known for his involvement in some unspeakable crimes. I heard some people go missing around the time Mark used to come around, and it wouldn't shock me if he was responsible given the stories about him. I always avoided getting caught by the law, though. But hey, maybe that's just hearsay. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. After hearing that, I knew it was best to put as much distance between Mark Reinhold and myself as possible. I continued my journey towards Raleigh, but Mark's eerie presence stayed with me, lurking in the corners of my mind. That night, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. It wasn't until several days later that I learned of a gory discovery near that same rest stop. The remains of several victims had been uncovered in a hidden ditch not far from where Mark had stood that night. While I was grateful that I escaped and scathed from my encounter with Mark Reinhold, it sent shivers down my spine, knowing how close I'd come to becoming one of his victims. To this day, whenever I drive past that rest stop near Greensboro on I-40, I can't help but remember the cold damp hand gripping mine and feel a chill passing over me as I wonder if Mark is still out there somewhere. But onward I continue, driving my truck into the night, keeping an eye out for any suspicious figures lurking in places they shouldn't be. After all, sometimes even truck drivers like me find themselves entangled in horrifying stories we'd rather forget. Feeling drained after another grueling day of trucking, I grumbled about the endless hours behind the wheel. My name is Nolan Carmichael, and I'm a mother trucker, quite literally. Actually, kids these days call me Trucker Dad, whatever that means. I pulled my beaten-up rig into the Hayesville Depot feeling the comforting weight of my wallet holding exactly nine extra unsanctioned dollars earned on some off-the-books cargo. As I parked in my usual spot beneath a flickering streetlight and locked up my rig, Harry, an old nameless dog who'd come to see me off every night for years now, ambled over with his tail wagging. Hey Harry, good to see you, old boy, I said wiping my greasy hands on my dirt streak jeans. My phone buzzed with a peculiar series of text messages from Floyd, another driver who shared the same roots as me. The last message caught my attention. I swear, Nolan, I have never seen anything like it. This dude just vanished. Curiosity pushed me deep into conversation when a distant scream echoed through the depot. My heart raced as I scanned the area while reaching for the spare tire iron I kept nearby. An urgent voice grabbed my attention. Nolan! You hear that? Something's not right! shouted Samantha, a newer driver who often frequented this stop. Yes, yeah, Sam, stay alert! 
Suddenly, the dog started barking in distress before retreating to his hiding spot. As Sam and I walked through the dimly lit depot together in search of answers, we stumbled upon a grisly scene. Oscar, one of our veteran associates, was pinned against the container by what appeared to be tentacles wrapped around him tightly. Life was fading from his eyes with every shallow breath as he gestured pleadingly towards us both. Panicked and rattled by what we saw, Sam called for backup while I tried to get closer to Oscar. Out of the darkness of the containers emerged a figure reeking of rotting flesh and a perverse mix of blood and sweat. Built like a hulking beast, the man's worn and scarred face portrayed a twisted sneer beneath his tangled beard. I ain't nobody, he snarled as his steely gaze met mine. I'm not who you think I am. Laughter escaped his cracked lips, chilling me to the bone. His entire demeanor oozed eerie calm, as though he'd done this before and enjoyed it. The man crept back into hiding beyond tangled shipping containers after giving us another menacing glare. The realization dawned upon us that, despite our best efforts, we were unable to save Oscar from this monster's grasp. Samantha and I retreated to our fellow truckers, hearts pounding as we waited for help to arrive. All the while, we knew the tormentor could strike again at any moment. He clearly had no regard for our lives or his own safety. He derived sick pleasure from causing chaos and anguish. We watched as police swarmed into the depot in search of this apparent serial killer, who only left us with questions about his true identity. As the police searched the depot, Samantha and I decided to gather as much information as possible about our attacker. We questioned fellow truckers and discovered that several of them had also encountered this mysterious and dangerous man. Some had barely escaped with their lives, while others were left severely injured. It became increasingly clear that we were dealing with a highly skilled, cold-blooded killer who took pleasure in causing pain. A local trucker named Doug had a particularly valuable piece of information. He had obtained security camera footage from a nearby warehouse, which revealed our attacker's face. From the footage, we were able to identify the man as Jack Winthrop, a former Marine who was dishonorably discharged due to his violent tendencies. Jack's motive was unclear, but his actions spoke volumes. He appeared to be targeting truckers specifically, perhaps because they were isolated and vulnerable targets or because he harbored some deep-seated resentment. Whatever the reason, Jack had become an expert at terrorizing those around him. Armed with this vital information, we shared it with the police, hoping they could apprehend Jack before anyone else fell victim to his brutality. As night fell, an eerie silence settled over the depot. The search for Jack ceased temporarily as law enforcement determined it was too dangerous to continue. Despite their best efforts, authorities were unable to locate any trace of this ruthless predator. That night I couldn't sleep, haunted by Oscar's gruesome demise and fearful that yet another innocent life would be lost. My mind raced as I tried to think of ways we could defend ourselves against such a relentless force of evil. Meanwhile, Samantha had managed to contact an old friend living nearby who was highly skilled in self-defense techniques. He reluctantly agreed to provide us with some basic hand-to-hand -hand combat skills so that we might have a fighting chance should we come face-to-face -face with our tormentor again. Samantha and I trained diligently over the next couple of days, using our newly acquired skills to build our confidence and bolster our defenses. All the while, Jack laid low, biding his time. Rumors spread amongst the truckers at the depot like wildfire, and the palpable sense of foreboding was impossible to ignore. One late evening, as I made my way across the depot to my rig, 
I caught sight of Jack slithering through the darkness between containers. His eyes locked on mine for a brief moment, filling me with a primal fear that set my nerves on edge. As he vanished into the shadows once more, I knew this wouldn't be our final confrontation. I alerted Samantha, and together we prepared ourselves for another possible encounter with Jack before help could arrive. However, no attack came that night or the next. In fact, days went by without any sightings or indications of Jack's presence. Instead, an uneasy quiet settled over the depot. Though it provided some relief from the constant tension we had been living under, we couldn't shake the sense that Jack was still nearby. Those who had witnessed savage attacks or lost friends became more cautious and vigilant, focusing intently on their surroundings. Just when we began to think Jack might never resurface, another blood-curdling scream shattered our tentative peace in the early hours of a new dawn. Rushing over to investigate, we discovered Jack standing ominously near a fresh victim whose life was slipping away rapidly. Anger and determination surged through us as Samantha and I charged toward him like a freight train out of control. Distracted by his prey and perhaps surprised by our sudden appearance, Jack hesitated just long enough for us to catch him off guard. Employing our newly learned combat techniques with precision and focus, we managed to keep him at bay until reinforcements arrived. Yet somehow, Despite being cornered, Jack slipped through our grasp once again, vanishing into the maze of shipping containers as police swarmed the area. As they reluctantly suspended the search, frustration and anxiety continued to gnaw at us all. For now, Jack remains elusive. He could be anywhere. He was hiding, plotting, and preparing for his next gruesome act. Though we can only speculate, one thing is certain. The nightmare is far from over for those who remain at the Hayesville Depot. And so, dear reader, I leave you with this chilling reminder. In the darkest shadows of humanity's most nightmarish stories, one never knows where a monster like Jack will reappear next. My name is Jasper O'Malley, and I'm a truck driver by trade. It is not the most glamorous job in the world, but it pays the bills. People often joke about how easy driving trucks must be, but let me tell you, it's not all sunshine and rainbows when you're behind the wheel of an 18-wheeler. Anyway, enough with the small talk. You're here for the story. It was a dark and stormy night. Sorry, I couldn't resist. But really, it was a pretty average Tuesday evening. I had been doing my usual route from Nevada to Colorado when I made a pit stop at this little gas station near Moab, Utah. The place didn't seem sketchy or anything and had great reviews, so I figured it would be a decent spot to refuel and grab some snacks. While browsing through the shelves stocked with chips and candy bars, my eyes suddenly caught something. No, not something on a shelf. It was a person, or rather their reflection in the store window. They were also browsing around while watching me. The guy was tall and lean. Wearing a hoodie that mostly concealed his facial features, he gave off an extremely unsettling vibe. I felt my muscles tense as if readying for unexpected trouble, and unease crept within me. Calm down, Jasper. I told myself under my breath, trying to brush off my feelings as mere paranoia. At that moment, the store clerk walked up to me with the brightest smile humanly possible. Hey there! Isn't this weather nuts? Finds lots of good stuff. Is there anything else I can help you with? I gave her a weak smile before nodding at my selection of snacks and replying with feigned enthusiasm. Yes. Thanks for asking. 
I'm just finishing up. As I made my way to the counter, utterly disturbed by whatever just happened back there with the mystery man, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. Every time I glanced back subtly, he kept his distance as if he himself were ghosting in and out of my peripheral. After paying for my purchase, I quickly made my way outside, only to realize that the creepy guy from earlier had disappeared entirely. The lot behind me remained quiet and empty, save for a random gust of wind brushing against the tree's dry leaves. As if on cue, my curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to check whether the guy's car was still around. Sure enough, there was an abandoned Pontiac casually resting its rust-filled body by the dumpster, like it belonged there. Feeling edgy and slightly paranoid, though now rightfully so, I turned on my heels and walked towards my rig with steady determination, eager to leave this place and put some distance between myself and its unsettling visitors. As I approached my truck, however, I heard something strange from behind, a faint sound that seemed impossible to pinpoint. It seemed like someone, or something, was trying to hold back laughter. No matter how hard I tried, that indescribable sinister sound wouldn't go away. It just kept getting louder and more unnerving. Suddenly, a loud crash echoed through the parking lot, rendering me frozen with fear for a moment. But soon enough, instinct kicked in, and I rushed towards my truck while fishing for my keys in my pocket. The laughter now sounded closer than ever. My truck's door unlocked with a mechanical click, and I scrambled inside. Every cell in my body was urging me to flee, but my good sense told me to at least try calling for help. It wasn't the most courageous option but it was the most rational one. I took out my phone and dialed 911, quickly explaining the situation to the operator. She assured me that help was on its way but urged me to stay put and lock the truck doors. I followed her instructions but couldn't shake the feeling that things were about to get much, much worse. As I waited anxiously, a horrifying scream pierced the air from inside the gas station. My heart pounded against my ribcage, and in that moment, I contemplated leaving everything behind before curiosity won once more. I grabbed a tire iron from under my seat as a makeshift weapon and exited my rig. Upon entering the gas station, I found the store clerk lying motionless on the floor. Her lifeless eyes stared blankly ahead while her limp body bled onto the linoleum tiles, a violent circular wound torn straight through her chest. Shocked by this gruesome sight, nausea tightened in my throat as I struggled to maintain control over my emotions. The killer was likely still around, somehow knowing that police would be arriving soon. I couldn't make myself search for him further within the gas station's confines. The wise option was to return to my truck and wait for authorities to arrive. Let them take over from here. As I backtracked toward my vehicle with haste in every step, a man staggered into sight from behind a dumpster. He was frantic and blood-soaked, clearly injured by none other than our mysterious killer. Ignoring any reservations and fear for my safety, I approached him cautiously. Hey, what's your name? Are you hurt? My words came out rushed, despite maintaining composure in such a tense situation. Thomas, he rasped. Help me, please. He caught me by surprise. His face. I don't know who he is but his attacks are relentless and merciless. As I helped Thomas toward my truck, we noticed the hooded man staring at us from a nearby alleyway. The darkness of the night masked his features entirely, making it impossible to recognize any distinguishing marks. However, as he walked closer, 
The mysterious man dropped an item onto the ground, a wallet containing Thomas's ID. The assailant somehow knew his name, but why? Those questions would have to wait as I hustled Thomas into the truck and waited for the police. Soon enough, sirens wailed in the distance, and they arrived quickly with guns drawn. They fanned out across the parking lot and into the gas station, no doubt expecting to find a dangerous scene. After assessing both Thomas's state and mine, they announced that they had apprehended a suspect. Although definitely human, their description matched that of our unknown attacker, standing at six feet tall, covered in bloodstains from our deceased store clerk and Thomas. Following an exchange of information with the police officers and confirmation of my account with them, I was given permission to leave. The remaining fears soon melted away with each mile I put between myself and that dreadful pit stop. It wasn't until days later that an officer called me with unsettling news. Thomas was found dead in his hospital room. The mysterious attacker had somehow infiltrated their security measures and finished what he started. The officer informed me that this man was none other than Roy Evans, a previously unheard of serial killer who began his reign of terror on civilians in this quiet Nevada town. How he had become so fixated on his victims was beyond comprehension. Though frighteningly intelligent and capable of unimaginable horrors, Roy proved elusive as authorities chased after him fruitlessly. As I hung up the phone, a cold shiver ran down my spine, one last reminder that a killer had been in my truck and that he was still out there. And though I knew not what the future would bring in our paths crossing again, I couldn't deny the eerie certainty of Roy Evans, the untraceable serial killer, waiting in the shadows for his next victim. My name is Clayton Knox, and I'm a truck driver. On the road, you see a lot of strange things, but nothing prepared me for the incident that occurred in a small town in Mississippi. Most of my friends think my job is boring, but I always joke that at least I get to enjoy the beautiful landscapes while they're stuck in their dull cubicles. One day, as I was making a run through Mississippi, I pulled over into a rest stop to stretch my legs and grab a bite to eat. The diner at the rest stop was filled with locals, creating a lively atmosphere. My meal was delightful. Nothing beats southern cuisine. After paying my bill, I headed outside and saw an idling car at the edge of the parking lot. Rolling down my window slightly to enjoy the fresh air, I spotted an off-duty cop sitting in his cruiser nearby. He looked worried and intense. Hey, I called out jokingly with a friendly wave. Are you on the lookout for some local troublemakers? He hesitated before giving me a weak smile. No, just trying to relax after working overtime. I shrugged it off and got back behind the wheel of my truck. Suddenly, approaching headlights caught my attention in my rearview mirror, just an ordinary car driving past me at full speed. Nothing unusual, right? Except the car didn't continue onward but abruptly stopped near me. The driver's side door burst open, revealing a disheveled man who lunged towards me with wild eyes and aggressive strides. This had escalated far too quickly for my liking. The man yanked at my truck's door handle with brute force. Thinking fast, I put all my weight against it. Fortunately, having an obsession with locking doors, which always annoyed my wife, saved me this time. Out of nowhere, a gunshot rang through the air. The man stumbled back, clutching his leg, screaming in pain. The off-duty cop had intervened on my behalf, firing a shot from his concealed weapon. 
With the man down, the cop yelled orders to keep him subdued while he called for backup. My heart pounded uncontrollably as I held fast, the injured man glaring daggers at me. Once backup arrived, I was questioned and thanked by some of the officers for my cooperation. During our brief conversation, I learned that this unexpected attacker was suspected of several unsolved, grisly murders around the country. But they never mentioned his name or explained how he chose his victims. As time crept by and my adrenaline subsided, I decided it was best to continue my journey. My hands shook as I got back into the truck and turned the ignition, a clear sign I needed a break soon. But life had to go on. I had a job and family to look after. The life of a truck driver is not easy. Long hours by yourself can sometimes let your imagination run wild. My encounter with this man-man still haunts me to this day, but it's just another tale to share during family dinner nights or when chatting with buddies. Having left the rest stop, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. Despite my natural inclination to avoid trouble, my curiosity gnawed at me, urging me to find out more about the dangerous individual who had tried to attack me. So, when I reached my destination and unloaded my truck for the day, I decided to discreetly contact a police officer who could help me get some answers. I dialed the number of a detective I knew named Joe Wheeler, and after exchanging pleasantries, I described my encounter in Mississippi. Joe was as intrigued by the assailant's identity as I was but said it would take him a couple of days to gather enough information. When Joe finally called back, he led with one chilling fact. Clayton, you were attacked by none other than William the Ripper Holland. William Holland earned his macabre nickname for his brutal attacks on unsuspecting people at rest stops and gas stations around the country. Once targeted, his victims were found horribly dismembered or mutilated, almost beyond recognition. The man was not just a murderer, he was a monster. But there was one piece of information that truly sent chills down my spine. Apparently, William had been stalking me for weeks before our confrontation in Mississippi. Even the cop at the rest stop was someone he'd targeted just prior to our encounter. Feeling deeply uneasy about having become the Ripper's prey because of my job, I knew that it would only be a matter of time until he would come after me again. I kept moving from town to town along my driving route but felt constantly on edge, as if someone were always watching me. When I finally spotted him, waiting outside a gas station along one of my stops, my blood ran cold. Staring him down in disbelief, I dialed Joe immediately on my cell phone and whispered desperately, Joe! He's here! I found him again, waiting for me at the gas station. What do I do? Joe, speaking rapidly but firmly, said, Clayton, you need to stay calm and don't let him see that you've seen him. I'm sending officers to your location. There's nowhere they can hide now. My heart pounded as I pretended not to have noticed the Ripper watching me from across the lot. I quickly hung up and debated what to do next, knowing full well that this might be my only chance to put an end to his terror. Inexplicably, the Ripper walked away from his hiding spot and disappeared behind the gas station. I followed carefully at a distance managing to lose sight of him for a split second. Suddenly there was a flash of movement, and the Ripper emerged before me, wielding a gleaming knife. Our eyes locked in this split second of shared realization. I charged at him with every ounce of strength I could muster, striking his hand with a rock I picked up from the ground. The impact caused him to drop the knife in pain, but it also alerted him to my presence. 
Quickly realizing that he couldn't win this battle on foot, the Ripper began sprinting toward an idling car nearby, smashing its window and hot-wiring the ignition before peeling off into the night. Defeated but still alive, I called Joe once again and relayed my encounter. He promised more patrols in every town on my driving route and reassured me that it was now only a matter of time until the Ripper would be caught once and for all. Days turned into weeks without further incidents. Still, I couldn't leave behind my experiences with him or forget the constant dread that pervaded every run through isolated towns on dark highways. As the long days stretched into longer nights, my thoughts always returned to William, the Ripper, Holland, a ruthless killer still at large, still stalking the world's quiet corners. The unnerving truth remained. He was out there, a malevolent shadow lurking just out of sight. My name is Simon Carter, and if you told me I'd be belly deep in terror during my truck driving route, I would have laughed it off like a bad joke. It just goes to show that life truly takes unexpected turns. I worked the late shift that night, delivering furniture to a warehouse outside of Dayton, Ohio. The local radio station played a mix of classic rock and oldies which made the long drives much more bearable. As I drove along Route 48, my headlights illuminated something disturbing just off the road. There were peculiar markings on a nearby tree trunk, with what appeared to be blood smeared across the bark. It looked as if someone had attempted to write some message or symbol that was getting interrupted every other stroke. My gut was telling me this wasn't some local kid's idea of a prank. It sent a chill up my spine. At least they didn't try spelling red rum. How cliche would that be? I muttered aloud in an attempt to bring some levity to the situation. I continued on my journey, trying not to dwell on the unsettling sight. As I was closing in on my destination an industrial complex near the outskirts of Dayton, I came across what looked like an abandoned car by the side of the road. Desperate pleas for help rang out from inside the vehicle. My heart raced as I checked on the stranded motorist, who turned out to be Anna Thompson, an offbeat college student with an interest in geocaching and impressionist painting. Her car had broken down, and she had no cell reception in this remote area. Hey there! Do you need a hand? I asked as I approached her vehicle cautiously. What took you so long? Anna half-jokingly exclaimed in relief. It wasn't long before Anna was in my truck's passenger seat while we searched for any sign of a mechanic shop. We exchanged friendly banter for a while laughing about shared pet peeves and the absurdity of pineapple pizza. Eventually, our conversation took a dark turn. I saw something back on Route 48 that made my skin crawl. I confided. I can't shake the feeling that we're not alone out here. Anna confessed to a similar nagging sense of dread and unease. Up ahead, the road twisted through a claustrophobic tunnel. Anna stiffened in her seat as we entered the darkness. It felt like an all-consuming void that threatened to consume whatever hope resided inside us. As we made our way out of the tunnel, a figure stood ominously at the exit. It appeared to be covered head to toe in dark clothing and had unnervingly elongated limbs. An unsettling smile stretched wide across its face, revealing rows of sharp teeth. I slammed on the brakes, barely managing to stop mere inches from the figure. It merely continued smiling as it took slow and deliberate steps toward my truck. The atmosphere in the truck shifted from casual camaraderie to sheer primal fear. 
With trembling hands, I locked all doors and rolled up any open windows. What is that thing? Anna cried desperately as we both stared, paralyzed by its deliberate approach. Stay in the car! I instructed urgently before grabbing a tire iron from under my seat. The figure seemed unfazed by my defensive stance as it continued advancing toward my truck. As it raised one of its abnormally long arms, potential weapons seemingly materialized into its grasp, a rusty knife, broken beer bottles. The figure's grotesque grin widened with each item appearing in hand. As the figure approached, brandishing its bizarre array of makeshift weapons, I couldn't bring myself to call for help. Doing so would risk drawing more innocent people into this nightmare scenario. I gripped the tire iron tightly in my hand, trying to maintain a sense of control and courage in an overwhelming situation. What do you want? I shouted at the figure. I knew it wouldn't respond, but maybe it could at least understand my defiance. The figure smirked as it replaced its weapons back into whatever they had come from. It fixated on Anna, who was pale and trembling in her seat. Before we knew it, the figure darted toward the truck with startling speed. As it reached for the door handle, I swung the tire iron as hard as I could, connecting with its arm in a sickening crunch. The figure reeled back in apparent pain before falling to the ground and vanishing into the darkness. Breathing heavily, Anna and I stared at each other in stunned disbelief. I think we should probably get out of here, I said cautiously. With nods of agreement, we sped off towards Dayton. Hours later, after reaching a populated area with working phone service, Anna finally got a tow truck. We waited together at a nearby diner for her car to be taken care of. At this point, our minds were racing with theories about what that horrifying figure could have been. While scanning news articles on my phone about similar incidents, I stumbled upon a story about a man named Gregor Collins. He had allegedly emerged from isolation after his family's tragic accident years prior and was said to reside somewhere in Ohio. Reports stated that he had somehow mastered ancient blood rituals that changed him physically, allowing him to torment unsuspecting victims with his nefarious talents. As far-fetched as the story seemed, I couldn't shake its similarity to our own terrifying encounter. A cold dread clenched my chest, but I kept the findings to myself not wanting to frighten Anna any further. We silently finished our meals before exchanging contact information and bidding each other farewell. I drove back to Route 48, filled with determination and trepidation. My only plan was to try and collect proof of this deadly, intelligent madman named Gregor Collins. I spent the next few days scouring every inch of the surrounding areas but found nothing. It seemed as though Gregor Collins had vanished or returned to the shadows from which he came. Finally, realizing that there was little more I could do, I reluctantly returned home. As I lay in bed that first night, unable to sleep despite sheer exhaustion, I considered how many others may have crossed paths with Gregor Collins and not lived to tell the tale. Though we had escaped with our lives, I couldn't shake the feeling that Gregor would continue his twisted campaign of terror. The very thought left an unsettling chill running through me, tinged with a horrible sense that we hadn't seen the last of that sinister figure. With our encounter with Gregor now a week behind us, I remained vigilant but couldn't help but wonder if he would ever reappear. Would he target me again? Or would he continue on his path of destruction, seeking out new victims like Anna and me? These questions haunted me each day that followed. Ultimately, no resolution came, just an uneasy silence ominously looming over Route 48. 
and as the silence grew louder by the day, my apprehension deepened, what might tomorrow hold? And would we ever truly be free from Gregor Collins's eerie presence? Only time will tell if our paths will cross one terrifying day again in the future. My name is Russell Hartman, and I've always considered my life to be relatively routine. As a truck driver, I spent most of my waking hours on the road, visiting various locations across the United States. But nothing could have prepared me for that harrowing event that would forever disturb my perception of life. It was a humid evening as I was driving through Asheville, North Carolina. The radio host was joking about the absurdity of pineapple on pizza when the sudden screeching of tires caught my attention. My heart raced as a car sped past me at breakneck speeds. The vehicle swerved violently, almost colliding with a nearby lamppost. You must be some kind of idiot. I mumbled to myself, trying to shake off the shock. Hopefully, they won't be causing too much trouble tonight. I continued driving and focused on making my way to the depot located in the industrial area of Asheville. With each mile that passed, an inexplicable sense of dread creeped into me like icy fingers around my throat. As much as I tried to focus on the road ahead, I couldn't shake it. Something was wrong. Arriving at the depot where I had to make my delivery, I noticed a strange figure outside the building's entrance, a tall man with a hood obscuring his face. He appeared menacing and out of place as he watched me park my rig and exit my truck. Caution kept me wary as I approached him. Hey there. I tried to sound nonchalant despite the tremor in my voice. You work here or something? He didn't reply or acknowledge me with any indication that he heard me speak. The uncertainty plunged further into unease when stinging pain radiated from one leg as if someone had struck it with a burning rod wrapped in barbed wire, unexpectedly escalating the intensity quickly. My vision blurred for a moment from sheer agony. When it cleared, the hooded man was gone. There was no explanation but I felt confident that the cloaked figure had something to do with it. Another surge of pain pulsed through my leg, netting a barely suppressed cry. People at the depot were eyeing me with concern but kept their distance. Desperate for relief, I dragged my uncooperative leg towards the people to ask for help. My pleas fell on deaf ears as they stared at me in abject fear. What's the matter? Can't you see I'm in pain? I yelled at them, my voice cracking under a wave of anguish. They muttered apologies and dove away from the scene like scared animals. Fighting back tears of frustration and confusion, I leaned against a nearby wall for support as pain repeatedly assaulted my leg. As I glanced around, trying to make sense of the situation and seeking someone who could help, I noticed the hooded figure reappear, now standing in front of a group of people who had joined him. At once, it became clear why no one offered assistance. They were terrified of him like lambs led to slaughter. His power over them, both incomprehensible and unreasonable, made me shudder at the thought of what this force could be capable of inflicting upon them all at that very moment. As I struggled to stand, I knew I needed help. But my cell phone lay inside the truck's cabin, seemingly miles away, with my injured leg as it was. My eyes darted around, searching for a passerby or someone who dared defy the hooded man and assist me. Suddenly, a worker braved stepping closer to me, whispering in hushed tones, His name's Vincent. He causes terror everywhere he goes. No one knows where he came from or what he wants, but he's dangerous and relentless. 
The worker warned me against using my phone to call for help when I inquired about it, telling me that Vincent had an uncanny ability to punish anyone who dared cross him. I'm not going to stand idly by while this man terrorizes everyone. I declared resolutely, determined to end his vicious rule. With stubborn resolve fueling each step, I made my way back to the truck and retrieved my phone. I dialed the local authorities and quickly recounted the events taking place. Dispatch assured me that help was on the way, but I couldn't help feeling that the situation had only escalated further since making the call. Glancing around, a noticeable change took place in the atmosphere. People appeared more afraid than before, their eyes darting frantically as they anticipated Vincent's retribution. Before long, sirens blared in the distance as police vehicles arrived on the scene. The officers approached cautiously as they surveyed their surroundings, demanding that Vincent surrender himself immediately. A chilling sound emanated from an unseen source. It resembled an animalistic snarl intertwined with guttural human laughter but fell short of either description entirely. More surges of pain splintered through my body, first in my leg, then branching out into new territories of torment along both arms and even my chest, rendering me nearly immobile as I sank against an exterior wall for support. Vincent abused his powers further, causing injuries among the terrified people gathered. A wave of despair washed over me as I witnessed his brutal display of crushing bones and tearing flesh with just the will of his mind. The gore and gruesome scene became too much for me to handle, and I averted my gaze from the carnage unfolding when officers attempted to approach him. They were quickly yet effortlessly dealt with, their broken bodies flung against nearby structures like rag dolls discarded without care. No one stood a chance unless something drastic took place. Tears streamed down my face as anguish at my own helplessness surged within me. My voice cracked as I yelled, Please, Vincent, just stop this. Let them go. To everyone's surprise, violence ceased entirely as silence swept over the depot like a suffocating shroud. Vincent turned to face those who remained standing, torn between hope and dread in equal measure. Do you truly wish for it to end? Vincent's voice resembled gravel scraping deep inside one's ear canal, jarring and intrusive when it connected with your senses. He paused as he studied my expression, then continued, Very well. With that single declaration, he melted back into the shadows from whence he first emerged, leaving devastation in his wake. It was only then that I considered the price of my desperate plea, my life for theirs. There was no doubt that he would come to claim me next. As days passed since Vincent's unceremonious departure from my life, a sense of unease plagued me constantly on every corner. Delivery after delivery took place under his looming, invisible presence that punctuated each breath and heartbeat I could count. I knew it was only a matter of time before my fate caught up with me, but until then, every second was borrowed time in which I cherished my existence more than ever before. I pulled into the small truck stop just outside of Eureka, Nevada, feeling the need to stretch my legs and grab a cup of coffee. My name's Dalton Hudspeth, and I'm a truck driver delivering all sorts of goods across this vast country. As I climbed out of my rig, a sense of unease washed over me for no apparent reason. This place seemed ordinary enough but something about it struck me as off. Ignoring the uneasy feeling, I made my way inside the dingy diner adjacent to the gas station. 
Behind the counter was a middle-aged woman with frazzled hair who seemed preoccupied with her crossword puzzle. Ordering my coffee black and hot, she poured it into a slightly stained mug before returning her attention to her game. After exchanging pleasantries and an attempt at humor on my part, I heard a commotion coming from outside. A man in red overalls was chasing after his dog, which had escaped from his pickup truck. Leave it to me to find comedy in the strangest places. I thought as I sipped on my scalding coffee, noting how life won't cease to surprise us. Slowly starting to relax back into my usual light-hearted demeanor, there came an abrupt interruption from the faint sound of someone screaming just beyond the parking lot. All movement inside the diner suddenly stopped as we listened intently. Feeling a sense of responsibility, given that the commotion was nearby, I stepped out and walked toward where I thought the scream originated from. The sound seemed muffled, as if coming from below the ground or behind thick walls. Having reached a row of storage units behind the truck stop area, I tried various doors but didn't have any luck finding their source. Growing more anxious as seconds ticked by, I finally heard another desperate scream piercing through one particular unit's door. Out of options and consumed by fear for whoever might be in need, I decided to kick down the door. It gave way after a few sturdy boots. As the dim sunlight seeped in, the grotesque scene that unfolded was one I would never forget. A tall man dressed in a dark hood and torn clothes stood over another individual chained to a wall. The bloodied victim had clearly been brutalized and now seemed to be choking on their own blood. The hooded man's hands were covered in gore, and different tools of torture were scattered around him. Seeing me, the man tilted his head and grinned from ear to ear, revealing a horrific set of rotting teeth and an unbridled madness within his eyes. My body went numb, unable to comprehend the morbid scenario taking place before me. I steeled myself for whatever might come next, but I knew that I could not face this monster alone. Desperately trying to signal the woman back at the diner for help without making any sudden moves, I attempted some pathetic lip gestures through the tiny, crack-open door as my eyes bore into her with urgency. Sadly, she did not grasp at my silent pleas or acknowledge my frightened gaze whatsoever. The feeling of being alone and vulnerable was overwhelming. Mustering all my courage, I glanced back towards the hooded man, only to see that he had disappeared and left his torture chamber momentarily unattended. Without further hesitation or thought, I sprinted across the truck stop, hoping against hope that I might somehow escape this nightmare unscathed. Focused on putting as much distance between myself and that horrifying scene as possible, I didn't notice my surroundings shifting around me. A dense fog rolled in from nowhere, silent save for its eerie whispers that threatened to drive me mad with fear. The dense fog disoriented me, but somehow I made my way back to the truck stop. With haste, I told the woman at the diner about what I had just witnessed, explaining that it was crucial that we call for help immediately. You mean like the police? She stammered nervously. Yes, I affirmed. But we need to make sure they get here quickly. There's a man and torturing people in those storage units. Seeing her worried expression and hesitance to take any quick action, I assumed control and dialed 911. Unfortunately, the fog had taken a toll on cell service, and I wasn't getting through. In a desperate attempt to save the victim, I pleaded with the lady at the diner to contact the local mechanic, who might have some bolt cutters or anything that could potentially free them. She hesitated but agreed after seeing my panic-stricken face. The visitor in red overalls from earlier overheard the commotion and offered to help as well. 
Together, we ventured back to that dread-filled storage unit, armed only with bolt cutters and a crowbar provided by the mechanic. I approached cautiously, fearing any sudden movements would provoke further harm to the victim. As we carefully opened the door, my blood turned cold at what lay before us. The storage unit was completely empty, no torture tools, no chained individual, and no hooded man in sight. What's going on? asked the man in red overalls nervously. I don't understand, I murmured in astonishment. I swear they were here just moments ago. The woman from the diner shook her head skeptically, likely questioning my sanity or if this was some sort of cruel hoax. Regardless of how it appeared, I knew what I had seen was real. My search for answers led me to make inquiries around town and discover that two locals, Marcia and Jim Merrick, had vanished in the last couple of months. The townspeople held a private meeting to discuss these disappearances and shared with me the name of Lenny Morton, a man recently released from prison whose actions matched those I had faced. The details were eerily similar, dark hoods, brutal murders, and merciless torture. I knew in my gut that Lenny was responsible, but we had no concrete evidence against him. Over the following days, I couldn't shake the haunting image of the bloodied victim from my mind. The gruesome brutality of it all settled in my thoughts, constantly reminding me of how easily our lives could be morphed into morbid canvases at the hands of a maniac like Lenny. Feeling incapable of leaving matters unresolved, I decided to act before any more innocent lives were taken. I made several attempts to contact law enforcement in neighboring towns but fell short due to them being stretched thin on other cases and insufficient evidence pointing to Lenny. I knew taking down someone as dangerous as Lenny Morton required a well-thought-out plan. As day turned into night, I carefully plotted my next move, hoping that somehow my actions would lead to his undoing. As I lay in bed that evening with every intention to confront Lenny Morton personally the following day, sleep eluded me. The thought of what might happen next was like a specter lurking just beyond sight, an eerie presence either seen nor understood fully but managing to claw its tendrils deep into every fiber of my being. Little did I know just how near danger truly was, unbeknownst to me or anyone else in Eureka. Lenny Morton's next vicious act would soon be unleashed upon us all, and the town would never be quite the same again. I'm Sam Owens, a truck driver by trade, and I've been in this business for two decades now. I've seen some wild things throughout the years but nothing compares to what transpired on this crazy night. The memory of that evening still sends shivers down my spine and makes me wonder if it wasn't all just some twisted illusion. Driving through a desolate stretch of highway in Nevada, I recall feeling strangely unnerved by the emptiness surrounding me, like I was the only living thing left in the world. The silence was broken only by the growling of my stomach. Figuring I could put off dinner no longer, I pulled over at a rickety roadside diner named Jenny Spoils. The diner seemed like it had been abandoned for years, yet it had a peculiar magnetism to it that compelled me to go inside. Jenny's spoils were dimly lit and deserted, save for an elderly couple hunched over their plates. The old man looked up at me and cracked a joke. You must be pretty brave or pretty hungry to eat here. Upon scanning the menu with growing suspicion and hesitation, I couldn't shake off the nagging feeling that something was terribly off about this place. Little did I know how right that gut instinct was, or how soon that would become painfully clear. 
As my meal was being prepared and I was getting increasingly desperate for any human connection in this eerie atmosphere, I struck up a conversation with the couple. We talked about life on the road, and they shared stories about their many travels across the country. Just before my food arrived, there was an abrupt disturbance outside, the screeching of tires and raised voices echoing into the diner. Though unsettling, no one else seemed disturbed by the commotion. Through the dirt-streaked window, I saw an imposing figure sprint past, broad-shouldered and clothed all in black with something resembling a ski mask covering his face. Moments later, the old woman screamed as her husband's eyes suddenly bulged and blood erupted from his mouth. I couldn't understand what had happened, but there was no time to find out. I bolted for the door, as my life depended on getting away from this inexplicable horror show. Heart pounding in my ears, I tore through the parking lot with my newfound foe hot on my heels. I desperately tried unlocking my truck while staying just out of reach of the masked assailant. Unable to call for help and all too cognizant of why none ever arrived at Jenny's spoils, I knew I was on my own against this merciless predator. As the masked assailant lunged at me with a gleaming blade, I flung open the door of my truck, dove inside, and slammed the door shut just in time. The knife struck the window with an ear-splitting crack, yet thankfully it held firm. Desperate to escape this sudden threat, I started the engine and slammed on the accelerator. The truck roared down the highway, my pursuer visible only as a fast receding dot in the side mirror. The once quiet night was now filled with terror and bloodshed. I grabbed my phone and attempted to call for help, but found that there was no signal in this remote wasteland. After inhaling deeply to calm my nerves, I decided to warn others about this psycho on the loose. I managed to come across a gas station where I approached a disheveled-looking man named Mike repairing his motorcycle. His calloused hands and weather-beaten face belied a kind-hearted nature. Upon realizing our common trait, he offered his help without hesitation. Together with Mike, we retraced our steps back to Jenny's spoils to ascertain what had happened. To our shock, we discovered a deserted place without even a trace of the elderly couple or their car. It was like they never existed. Our quest for answers about who was tormenting us led us through Nevada's treacherous landscape toward rural communities that were plagued by similar grisly crimes. We met other survivors who spoke of a nameless figure that haunted highways and backroads, picking off lone travelers with methodical ease. Then one day we encountered a cryptic message scrawled along the wall of an abandoned motel lobby written by someone who claimed to know our attacker's identity. Beware of James Blackridge. Eager for closure, Mike decided to visit nearby towns to gather more information about James Blackridge while I searched online for leads on my laptop. During these research sessions, I discovered disturbing details about the man. He had been a respected yet feared law enforcement officer with a penchant for catching criminals through unorthodox methods that frequently resulted in bloodshed. We continued to follow the trail of clues across Nevada, piecing together an intricate picture of James Blackridge and his dastardly acts. We found a pattern in his attacks. He'd assault truck drivers and travelers who happened to be passing through abandoned diner towns along desolate stretches of highways. With each survivor we met, the stories grew crueler and more elaborate. It appeared that Blackridge was orchestrating some demented game fueled by an insatiable thirst for violence. He would plant himself in remote locations, waiting patiently for unsuspecting victims to cross his path before striking without hesitation. As we were pressing on, Mike suddenly received word from a new acquaintance named John, 
who claimed to have stumbled upon Blackridge's hideout deep in the heart of an old mining complex. As much as I dreaded encountering the man responsible for our terrifying ordeal once again, I knew it was time to confront him. Armed with makeshift weapons and our strength and resolve, we set out to end this twisted saga at its center. Under the cover of darkness, we ventured into the abandoned mining facility, guided only by the eerie glow of our flashlights. Creeping through narrow tunnels carved out by forgotten workers long ago, we held our breath as every creak and rumble echoed ominously around us. Without warning, we were suddenly doused in a torrent of water from a collapsed part of the tunnel roof. As the water swept us away into an obscure cavern alongside the skeletal remains of Blackridge's numerous victims, we discovered that he had anticipated our arrival all along. It was there that we caught sight of him, standing tall amidst the carnage that he had created. Blackridge stared at us with a sinister grin plastered across his face. He was toying with us, pitting us in this life-or-death game of cat and mouse where he would always remain one step ahead. We could not win this game, but we couldn't back down either. His visage haunted me as we made a narrow escape from that harrowing place, leaving behind the hall of horrors Blackridge had created. We vowed to warn others and continue our pursuit to expose the truth about James Blackridge, all the while knowing we were at his mercy, forever awaiting his next dreaded appearance from the shadows. It was my first time driving through Stillwater, Oklahoma, not a name I'd ever heard before, but GPS insisted it was the quickest route to my next drop-off. I stopped for lunch at a small, dingy roadside diner to stretch my legs and enjoy a greasy hamburger. A group of burly truckers sat at the bar engaged in a heated discussion, punctuated by bouts of deep belly laughter. As I paid the bill, one of them, a burly man with a graying beard called out to me. Hey, buddy, he said, chuckling. You heading out? Be careful on these roads. You never know what kind of trouble you'll run into. I nodded politely, mustering up a light-hearted reply. I've seen enough horror movies to last me a lifetime. I'll be just fine. With that, I left the diner and hit the road again. Miles down the highway, surrounded by rolling hills and sprawling farmland as far as the eye could see, darkness slowly crept in. Twilight cast an eerie glow on everything around me as my headlights sliced through the impending night. The boredom of hours behind the wheel began to weigh heavily on me. It seemed like every mile marker looked the same as the last. Desperate for something, anything, to break the monotony of my journey, I turned up the radio in search of some tunes. As I searched for stations, static ringed loudly through my truck cab before being interrupted with an emergency warning. Attention all drivers! Authorities are searching for an escaped prisoner, possibly armed and dangerous, last seen near Stillwater. My blood ran cold at those words. The very alertness that evening news always seems to warn us about is now haunting me. I gripped the wheel tighter and increased my speed as darkness swallowed up any remaining trace of daylight. That's when it happened. As I rounded a bend, my headlights caught strands of unkempt hair and a gaunt, pale face staring at me with wild eyes. The bone-chilling image lasted only a split second before disappearing, and I was left feeling nauseous and paranoid. I couldn't tell if my mind was playing tricks on me or if I had genuinely just encountered the escaped prisoner. Suddenly, all those funny jokes shared back at the diner became deadly serious. Imagine being stalked on a dark country road, 
one can only begin to grasp the chilling reality I faced that evening. Heart pounding in my chest, I tried to stay focused on the road ahead while casting wary glances in every direction. Knowing help was miles away, there was no other option but to turn off the route and find another way out. At the next intersection, I dashed left down an unknown path that seemed even more isolated than before. Convinced that every rustle of wind or rumble of my engine masked the sound of the murderous escapee closing in on me, my sanity began to fray at the edges. The quiet loneliness threatened to consume me whole when, out of nowhere, glaring red and blue lights filled my rearview mirror. Relief washed over me like a tidal wave as I pulled over, convinced that this would be my saving grace from this nightmare ride through Stillwater. The police officer approached the side of my truck, his uniform partially covered in mud, and demanded that I step out of the vehicle while seemingly sizing me up with hollow eyes. Adrenaline coursed through me as suspicion moved like whispers near the edge of my consciousness. Could it be possible that the very person I sought safety in was none other than my own personal terror coming to life? In those desperate moments clinging to survival, there's no time for conclusions, just kindling precursors for an intensifying firestorm. As he reached threateningly for his holster, I made a split-second decision and slammed the accelerator, peeling away from the scene. In a fleeting flash... I took off into an uncertain fate. Our altercation only began as the very essence of horror unraveled before me. My focus shifted between the rearview mirror and the winding road as I pushed my truck to its limit. I knew I couldn't outrun a police cruiser, but the adrenaline had taken hold, and thoughts of survival drowned out any sense of rationality. A gunshot pierced the silence the bullet hitting my rearview window and sending shards of glass flying. I winced, narrowly evading an injury. This confirmed my suspicion. The officer was, in truth, the escaped prisoner, and he was intent on stopping me by any means necessary. Seeing a gas station sign just ahead, I swerved off the road and raced toward it. As I pulled in, Horrified faces and headlights looked back at me as bystanders ducked for cover. They knew the danger that approached. An older woman dashed into the gas station to hide behind a safety barricade, clutching her cell phone close. The police car screeched into view mere seconds later. The shooter kicked open the door and stepped out of the vehicle like an ominous demon from a nightmare. His face was distorted by rage, and his eyes absorbed every detail in his brutal pursuit. My mind raced as I weighed my options. If I tried calling for help now, there was no chance I'd escape alive. Instead, I scanned my surroundings for an unlikely plan that began to form. I dipped behind one of the gas pumps when he turned his attention towards me momentarily. Crouching low as fear and intuition guided me steadily forward, each step became an adrenaline-fueled goal toward an uncertain outcome. With incredible luck or unbridled desperation driving him forward, he failed to notice my rapid slink behind a dilapidated shed. As he approached with deadly intentions inked across his grimace, shouts echoed through the night air. Stop! Put your hands up! Realizing law enforcement had arrived at last, he feverishly snarled at their commands while shooting blindly into the darkness. Stifling a scream, I cringed in a hidden corner as officers opened fire, their bullets biting gruesome paths through the night. The tumultuous battle felt eternal, but in mere seconds the gunfire ceased. It was over. Eerily, no lifeless form lay battered on the ground. My antagonist had escaped once again into that cold, dark abyss from which he emerged. Kneeling with trembling relief, 
I breathed in the aftermath as officers rushed to help. It wasn't until days later that I'd learn his name, Max Holden, a man notorious for his sadistic killings and uncanny ability to avoid capture by authorities at every turn. Even now, knowing Max is still at large sends chills down my spine. Who knows where he'll appear next or whom he may target. The horror of that fateful night will always lurk in my mind the ghost of danger whispering through every mile I drive on those long stretches of lonely roads. Weary and shaken to my core, I can only hope the day will come when Max is finally captured or meets his end. Until then, I continue driving along the desolate highways of this country, a witness to terror who must endure an unwelcome passenger lurking amidst shadows of fear. As I pulled out of Littleton, Colorado, behind the wheel of my trusty truck, Bonita, I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. It was a strange day indeed. I'd come across a flock of pink chickens near the highway earlier. The bizarre sight made escaping Littleton feel slightly surreal. My name is Darius Lunsford. I've been a truck driver for almost two decades now and it's truly never been dull. Today was no different in that regard. Driving my usual route along the I-70, I stopped at the Blue Jay Diner for a quick bite to eat. It was here that an unassuming man named Milton introduced himself. We chatted over some greasy burgers and shared the kind of banter you'd expect from two strangers with nothing else to do. Milton seemed like any other person you'd meet on the road, quirky and forgettable. As we wrapped up our meal and were preparing to leave the diner, some panicked customers burst into the Blue Jay Diner with shocking news. There had been a series of horrifying incidents in Boulder, not far from where we were now. They told us all about a twisted individual who leaves behind gruesome scenes with signature atrocities. Eyeballs removed from his victims and replaced with hollowed-out rubber balls. The idea made my stomach churn. Suddenly, Milton's interest in my route plans didn't seem so innocent anymore. Had I invited danger to sit beside me at that booth? Paranoia nod at my thoughts as I finished off my coffee. Without making much fuss, we each went our separate ways but my gut feeling never left me throughout the night. Contemplating whether or not to call for help crossed my mind more than once on this long-haul delivery east through Kansas. Around midnight, during another scheduled pit stop, I found myself tucked away in an isolated spot just off Highway 24. It was silent except for the hum of Bonita's engine. As I was walking back to the truck, it felt like ominous eyes were watching me from the shadows. Suddenly, I heard a loud thump, followed by an unsettling scratching sound. I anxiously peered under the truck to find reason, only to see a figure dart away into the darkness. My heart raced. Something didn't feel right. I clambered back into Bonita's cab and locked the doors, gripping my phone at the ready. Too afraid to call out for help due to how Milton might respond, I knew it wouldn't be long before this cat-and-mouse game would reach its climax. That's when it happened. Bonita's engine came to life, and so did all my hopes of ever getting help. Milton must have tampered with my rig while we were occupied in conversation just a few hours before. The acceleration threw me back in my seat as Bonita careened down Highway 24 at breakneck speed. I struggled to maintain control when suddenly another car appeared from behind a bend, blaring its horn in desperation, knowing that they wouldn't be able to avoid a head-on collision. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I tightly gripped the steering wheel, barely managing to swerve around the other car. 
I felt a small sense of relief when I avoided the head-on collision, but knew I could not escape from Milton's control. As I continued driving at a dangerously high speed, I decided to contact a fellow trucker named Rick when it was safe to do so. Rick was an old friend and trustworthy, someone who could help me decipher this unsettling situation. Once Bonita and I entered an open stretch of road, I dialed Rick's number using a voice command. The call connected, and I briefly explained my predicament without revealing too much information. Rick, you gotta help me, I said anxiously. There's this guy named Milton who tampered with my rig back in Colorado. And now I'm driving uncontrollably fast. What should I do? Rick took a moment before he responded. Darius, you need to pull over ASAP and disconnect the engine. That'll stop whatever he did to your truck. I glanced around the highway as the distant road lights blurred past me. There's no way that's going to happen until Bonita runs out of gas, I admitted. For the next hour, Rick stayed on the phone with me as we tried to find a safe solution until the inevitable fuel depletion left Bonita useless. Milton's twisted actions became apparent before long as bodies appeared laid out across the road with various stages of disfigurement, blood-curdling images that haunt my dreams till today. Eventually, Bonita finally exhausted her fuel supply, bringing me to a slow halt on Highway 24. My heart pounded in my chest as fear gripped me at the realization that Milton could reappear at any moment. While waiting for Rick to arrive with his tow truck from three hours away, another driver stopped to assist me. He introduced himself as Pete, a mechanic from a nearby town. As we spoke, I mentioned the name of my tormentor, Milton. Pete took a sharp breath and then continued. He revealed that Milton was a notorious psychopath who left behind his heinous acts gruesome scenes all over the country. It sickened me to see how he carried out these dreadful acts in such vicious ways. Later that night, Rick arrived with his tow truck rescuing me from the remote roadside and offering solace amid this hellish ordeal. He sought out Pete and requested that he look after Bonita while he towed me back home. As we drove away from the horrific scene, a sinister feeling lingered deep within me. Despite acknowledging that Milton was somewhere out there, a wandering terror, my experience reminded me that evil could lurk behind everyday encounters. Over time, the memories of those traumatizing events began to fade, but I never let down my guard when meeting strangers on the road. I often wonder if Milton continues his vile deeds elsewhere or if fate eventually leads him to meet his match. This chilling encounter left an indelible mark on my psyche. Though closure eludes me, Knowing someone as insidious as Milton Rome's free haunts my every mile on these lonely highways. After working the late shift at a truck stop in Eureka, Nevada, I swear, it felt like I could kayak down a river of coffee just to stay awake. My name's Max Donnellan, by the way, and I've been driving trucks for the past 15 years. Let me tell you about the time I had the most hair-raising night of my life. After finishing my break, I hopped back in the cab with another long stretch of road ahead of me. The air was thick with desert dust, smothering any stars that might have lit up my journey otherwise. Miles of desolate land stretched lazily on either side of my route. My radio crackled to life, and a fellow trucker named Earl cracked one of his goofy jokes through the static. Hey Max, you know what's creepier than me on this lonely boulevard at midnight? What's that? I asked with a chuckle. 
A mime is trying to open a jar of invisible peanut butter. He laughed uproariously while I rolled my eyes. The road wove through an area close to some old mining tunnels that had long been abandoned. That's when things started getting strange. I noticed odd sounds coming from the back of my trailer. At first, I dismissed it as nothing but cargo shifting due to sharp turns taken earlier in the drive. But as time dragged on and the noises grew louder, unnerving scratches and dulled thuds, my pulse quickened and paranoia set in. A small diner appeared in the distance, so I pulled over for some chow, hoping against hope that it would quiet the eerie atmosphere brewing inside me. But even that respite was short-lived. As soon as I stepped out of my cab, anyone who could walk away did so immediately. Earl's voice crackled through my radio again. It sounded like there was just enough signal left for us to have a somewhat coherent conversation. Max, buddy, where the hell are you? You sound a million miles away, he asked, concern tinging his usually jovial tone. I can't put my finger on it, I admitted. I keep hearing these strange noises coming from the back of the trailer. And this diner I just stopped at. It's like everyone saw a ghost when I arrived. As soon as the words left my mouth, an unwelcome, spine-chilling stench crept into my nostrils. All right, look, Earl started. Listen to me for a second. The mining tunnels out there have some strange stories attached to them. He hesitated before continuing in a hushed voice. Some say they were cursed by miners who perished decades ago. My muttered disapproval must have been loud enough because he promptly stopped. Feeling that gnawing curiosity within me, though, I decided to check the back of the trailer. I was itching with consternation as I reached for the padlock guarding my cargo, and every passing second just wound me tighter. Just as I prepared to unlock it and see what devilish thing lurked within, a woman shrieked from inside the diner. Thud after thud rumbled toward me from what sounded like more depths than from inside my truck. Chaos ensued inside the small building as men and women scrambled over each other in their panic to get away from something terrifying. A group of burly bikers thundered out in disarray so fast that it knocked me off balance, with one less than gentle push onto the dusty floor. It was standing behind one of the bikers as though it had cemented itself to him. Its horrifying frame was only visible when they moved apart like rats fleeing flooding sewers. Quick on its feet but solid in stature and appearance, with smoke for eyes and a hellfire look about it. If the rumors had any grain of truth, tonight they met reality. And that reality was stranger, more brutal, and darker than any myth from the past. A fierce growl echoed through the upheaval. A tremendous force slammed into the trailer as the creature lunged. And that was when hell started breaking loose. With the night turning into sheer terror, I had no choice but to call for help. I hastily dialed the local police as the bikers screamed in fear, one after another being targeted by this gruesome assailant. He had a disfigured face, marred with blood, and his body was muscular and covered in an assortment of repulsive scars. The unseen force he exuded remained pervasive, churning the diner into a frenzy even before people saw him. The police were skeptical about my description but sent officers to our location regardless. Gripped by a sense of dread, I watched helplessly as the monstrous attacker made quick work of everyone unfortunate enough to cross his path. As chaos unraveled around me, I noticed large tire tracks outside the diner that seemed out of place. They led towards the old mining area and disappeared into its dark recesses. With police en route, I decided that I needed to do something drastic, 
confront this being head-on and try to stop him before more lives were lost. The trucker community often shared stories about a vicious man named Jasper Atkins, tales about how he'd gone mad from years working in the mines before disappearing without a trace. Some people claim Jasper had managed to survive all these years by performing unspeakable acts on unlucky travelers who ventured too close to his hidden lair, drinking blood and consuming organs for sustenance. What if this creature stalking us was none other than Jasper himself? Desperate for answers, I followed the gruesome tracks. Upon entering the mine, my suspicions were confirmed. Among the mutilated corpses and grotesque imagery scribbled onto the tunnel walls was Jasper's name. Moving further into the depths of this horrifying place, my eyes glimpsed fragments of cloth that bore an uncanny resemblance to those worn by Jasper on his last known sighting. As I scrambled around trying to collect more clues to verify my theory, sirens wailed in the distance outside the diner and there behind me stood Jasper. He snarled viciously, his bloodshot eyes locking onto mine. Quickly assessing that an all-out brawl would be futile considering his sheer size and ferocity, I opted for a tactical retreat. I sprinted back to the entrance, ushering in the police. The brave yet ill-prepared lawmen loaded their guns and ventured deeper into the tunnels fervently hoping to bring an end to Jasper's reign of bloodshed. Moments later, the nightmarish sound of gunshots echoed through the caverns, silencing abruptly as more screams signaled their doom. When it became clear that Jasper had obliterated the police presence with terrifying ease, I sorrowfully abandoned my pursuit of answers and returned to my truck at the diner. Recounting my plight to Earl over the radio as I sped away from that godforsaken place, he listened with morbid fascination before revealing that he'd heard similar stories from other drivers about mysterious disappearances throughout this region. It seems nowhere is safe, mused Earl solemnly. And even with your fearless efforts tonight, who knows when and where Jasper will strike again? As I drove into the night ruminating on the fates of those victims fallen to this bloodthirsty menace, and haunted by my inability to end his gruesome spree, I couldn't shake a lingering sense of unease. Seemingly undebatable truth overshadowed any slight reprieve. It was only a matter of time before Jasper emerged once more, ready to unleash mayhem on another unsuspecting group of souls. My name is Landon Forrester, and I'm a truck driver. The thing about my job is that it can be damn lonely, but that suits me just fine. Anyway, life wasn't always so solitary. I was known for cracking jokes to lighten the mood, making people laugh even in the darkest of times. A while back, I happened to be driving through a small town called Wiley's Grove. I'd never been there before, but it seemed like a good place to make a pit stop. Little did I know that Wiley's Grove would thrust me into a nightmare that still haunts my subconscious. I parked my rig outside of a dingy-looking diner and ventured inside to grab something hot to eat. The atmosphere inside was friendly enough with locals chatting amongst themselves and an old cook flipping burgers behind the counter. As I slid into a booth by myself, my eyes couldn't help but land on the front page of the local newspaper someone had left behind on the table. It featured some grisly images of people who had gone missing, their clothes shredded, and blood stains marking their last known locations. Kicking things off with my usual sense of humor, I called out lightly. Hey, whoever's making these Grahamstown patterns on the ground should try their hand at painting. Nobody so much as chuckled at my comment. 
I was starting to realize how unwelcome my humor was when an elderly man who had overheard my comments sat down opposite me in the booth. He wore an unreadable expression and eyed me cautiously as he spoke in hushed tones. Son, he began gravely, I don't know who you are or what you're doing here in Wiley's Grove, but take this old man's advice. Don't joke about stuff like that around here. But why? I asked innocently, trying to understand his point of view. This town's got something dark going on these days. Some folks say there's a serial killer on the loose, except no one knows who or what it is. All we tend to find is remains. At that very moment, I noticed the hulking figure slip into the diner. The man was massive and disheveled looking, with heavy work boots blood-stained clothing, and gruesome scars on his face that seemed fresh. He lumbered over to the counter and began eating with ravenous hunger. At first glance, no one would blame me for jumping to the conclusion that he might be the mysterious attacker in Wiley's Grove. I think I might have an idea of who our killer might be, I whispered to the old man nodding towards the suspicious individual at the counter, though he looked horrified at my reasoning. That's Big Joe, he murmured, almost too quiet to hear. No one knows how he got those wounds or why he's still alive. Rumor has it, though, whatever hurt him has been tormenting this town ever since. I couldn't shake the feeling that Big Joe held the secret to uncovering Wiley's Grove's hidden horror. So instead of getting back in my truck, I decided to follow him when he left the diner. Through empty streets blanketed in darkness, I trailed behind him until we reached a rickety old house on the edge of town. My curiosity getting the better of me, I peered through one of its cracked windows to witness a disturbing sight. Big Joe opened a trap door hidden beneath one of his cabinets and started bringing out unspeakable things, body parts wrapped in plastic. Was this where it all happened? Was Big Joe both victim and perpetrator in this twisted tale? Suddenly, a horrific snarl and another heavy figure emerged from amid large wooden crates in the garage, clearly having taken notice of my intrusive gaze. Before I could make any sense of the situation, my field of view exploded with vicious snarls and blood-curdling screams. I found myself frozen in terror as I watched Big Joe struggle with this thing. My fight-or-flight instincts pushed me to run back to my truck and make a break for it, but call it duty or curiosity. I couldn't leave Big Joe to suffer at the hands of the true menace behind all those mutilations. Still standing by the cracked window, my heart raced as I watched the gruesome scene unfold before me. Big Joe grappled with the monstrous attacker, his fist struggling to land any blows on a man seemingly made of sinew and muscle. Despite Big Joe's impressive size, this person was a force to be reckoned with. Should I call for help? It would make sense. However, as I weighed my options, it became apparent that my call would likely go unnoticed in this quiet town. Furthermore, time was of the essence. If someone did respond to my plea, it might already be too late for both Big Joe and myself. I assessed my surroundings and found a rusty crowbar on the ground in front of me. Gripping it tightly, I resolved to face this adversary head-on. As I stepped inside the old house without making a sound, I braced myself for what had to be done. The two men were still locked in combat before me. With all my strength, I swung the crowbar towards the attacker's head. The impact sent him crashing into a wall. Dazed from the blow, he tried to get up, giving Big Joe an opportunity to pin him down, both panting heavily from exertion. An uneasy silence descended upon the room as Big Joe held him down while still visibly battering himself. At this point, 
There was no denying my involvement in this chilling dispute. Overcome with curiosity and fear gripping me tight, I decided that someone must know about this terrifying creature. After some hesitation, we hauled the subdued attacker out of the house and restrained him with chains found around the property. Despite our initial success in taking him down, we knew keeping him bound wasn't a long-term solution. Although we remained uncertain about his motives or origins, it was clear he wasn't your typical human being. It was also evident that we couldn't let him terrorize Wiley's Grove any longer. Big Joe revealed that the local sheriff was a childhood friend. He concluded that speaking to the sheriff, a trustworthy man named Dan, may be our only shot at finding answers. Dan listened intently to our story, his face falling with horror and disbelief. Eventually, he recounted a tale of his own, one of a troubled youth named Samuel Anders who disappeared just before the gruesome attacks began. His violent history and tendency toward trouble had long been whispered about in town, garnering no sympathy from those he left behind. While the townspeople assumed Samuel had fled to nurse his shattered reputation, Dan believed there was more to it than that. The explanation behind his transformation into this monstrous man was what truly puzzled him. The wounds Samuel sustained could only have been inflicted by another human, cruelly mutilating him before unleashing him upon Wiley's Grove. With no choice left but to keep Samuel restrained for now, we knew we need to find out more information in order to prevent further torment. The reality of Samuel's gruesome attacks hung heavy in the air as we exchanged grim looks. There were more victims we hadn't even known about, all taken brutally from their lives for reasons unknown. As Big Joe and I left Dan's office, we felt not only unsettled by our harrowing experience, but also more determined than ever to unmask whoever held the key to this most sinister tale. What appalling fate awaited Samuel Anders? What would await us as we dove deeper into the abyss? We stood at the precipice of a haunting mystery, one we were unsure if we'd ever truly solve, and yet turning back seemed impossible now. Our weary minds were already consumed by visions of the grisly horrors and chilling unknowns that lay ahead. It was a chilly Wednesday evening, and I found myself sitting at the worn-down counter of Billy's Diner, sipping on some black coffee and waiting for my burger and fries to be served. I've always appreciated these late-night pit stops. You can spot the most fascinating slices of life at trucker-centric diners like this one. In walked a man whose rugged appearance made him stand out. His hair was disheveled, his clothes were stained, and he came in and took a seat at the other end of the counter. The waitress glanced warily between us before forcing a smile and attending to him. A scream from the kitchen abruptly shook us all from our mundane routine, stopping our waitress in her tracks as she dropped the coffee pot she had been holding. As everyone stared at the kitchen doors on edge, out stumbled one of the chefs, ashen-faced and terrified. A massive explosion roared inside the kitchen. It blew open everything like a tornado had touched down. People ran away, terrified. Debris shot across the room. Amidst cries of helplessness and chaos, I glanced back at the disheveled man who had walked in earlier. There was something in his expression that piqued my intrigue, a mix of dread and resignation. The diner was thrown into chaos as police sirens wailed in the distance. As people scurried past me in a blur or tried to give their statements to arriving officers, I made my way to the entrance only to be stopped by a hand on my shoulder. The same disheveled man stood in front of me. Look, buddy. 
he whispered urgently into my ear. I don't know who you are, but that man lying amongst the ruins inside there, Edgar Nolan, is an infamous serial killer who's been haunting these roads for years. He let go of me and rushed forward disappearing into the night before completing his sentences. My world spun as I tried to process the information, noticing a sharp metallic taste caused by a sudden, forceful impact against my mouth. My dazed state allowed me just enough mental acuity to see the disheveled man speedily cut himself free of the ropes that restrained his hands before I was back in darkness. The very next instant... I was rudely hoisted up by the collar of my shirt and slammed onto an overturned table, still wet from spilled coffee. Gasping for air, trying to escape the suffocating grip of the serial killer, I reached down and picked up a broken shard of glass that had been knocked over earlier. With the shard of glass in hand, I stabbed it into Edgar Nolan's forearm. He howled in pain and released his grip on me. I didn't dare stay to see what would happen next. I sprinted towards the door, desperate to leave the carnage behind. I stumbled outside into the cold evening air, my heart pounding as I tried to decide my next move. The sirens grew louder, and I knew I couldn't remain there any longer. As much as I wanted to call for help, Something told me not to involve anyone else. A life-or-death situation like this could easily lead to more casualties. Running in a random direction, I took a side road and found shelter behind a truck trailer parked there. As expected, Edgar Nolan had pursued me. Despite his outward disheveled appearance, he moved with terrifying grace. His gait was smooth and calculated as he hunted me, his prey. My breath caught in my throat as he approached my hiding spot, followed by the sudden arrival of police cars filling the main entrance of Billy's diner. The flashing lights illuminated his distorted face, revealing what looked like scars that may have once been an attempt at self-mutilation or purposeful rough ridges created for an eerie effect. The officers rushed into the diner while two remained outside, looking for any witnesses or suspects that may have fled the scene. They couldn't grasp the true monster responsible. Some things don't live within our realm of thought. As Edgar walked away from me, his peculiar scarred face lingering in my mind, he stopped abruptly and stared directly at an officer who had turned her attention towards him. She paused for a moment before yelling, Stop! at him while aiming her gun. He stood unfazed while staring back at her calmly. She fired two shots right at his chest. Shocked by this quick act of violence in front of them, other officers surrounded the scene. Edgar, however, appeared unscathed by the bullets and continued his alarming gaze at the officer. Then... Without a word or any facial expression change, he turned around and walked away. No one dared follow him. In the aftermath of that chilling night, a manhunt ensued for the now infamous serial killer Edgar Nolan. The diner he left in ruins held just the taste of his brutal repertoire. Over time, more information about Edgar Nolan's identity emerged. A truck driver who went missing years earlier had run-ins with this terrifying figure. This trucker shared details of his encounters with Edgar before going off-grid in fear for his own life. It turns out his instincts were correct. It seemed like fate that our paths crossed at Billy's Diner, mine due to happenstance and curious observation while his driven by an insatiable bloodlust. Ever since that fateful day, I've found myself always looking over my shoulder, wondering if he's lurking nearby or when he might strike next. But Edgar Nolan keeps eluding capture, as if a phantom that vanishes like smoke in the wind. My head spins with questions left unanswered, 
How did he brush off two bullets so effortlessly? What twisted logic ran through his mind to fuel such horrific acts? Was there hope anyone would ever catch him or learn from his victims' tragic stories? As days turn into restless nights, I continue to bear witness to the horrifying memories of that night at Billy's Diner, knowing full well that it only scratches at the depths of what Edgar Nolan has done and may continue to do. My name is Leonard Bradshaw, and I'm a truck driver by trade. Some people laugh and make jokes when they hear that, but I'm proud of what I do. I keep the country's wheels turning and ensure that goods get to their destination on time. But there's something you should know about my job. It's not always as straightforward as it seems. In fact, there are times when things get downright terrifying. I'm driving through a small town in Alabama I like to call Spidersville, owing to an unsuccessful attempt to conquer my fear of spiders. In any case, the town is quiet at this time of the evening, and I am about to make my last stop before heading home. Pulling into a gas station for a late-night refuel, I walk into the small convenience store where two other customers are casually chatting and browsing through the snacks. We exchange nods before I make my way to grab some coffee. Jason Rowley, a dear friend and fellow truck driver, sits nervously by the door of the shop. Have you been listening to the news lately? He asks solemnly. What's going on? I reply, sipping my warm coffee before grabbing a pack of jerky. They've found three bodies in the last week, he says quietly. All were mutilated beyond recognition. Just what we need, I grumble. Some psychos are going around killing for fun. Jason slowly nods his head in agreement before we continue with our conversation about our roots. A sliver of dread starts creeping up on me as Jason mentions how another trucker discovered one of those victims' remains just past that deserted parking lot we always use for breaks. A while later, with an eerie sensation crawling beneath my skin, I gear up and continue my route, unable to shrug off that conversation with Jason. The moon only offers a flickering light to guide my way through the dusty, isolated roads of Alabama. My eyelids grow heavy, and I decide it's time to pull over to a spot well off the main highway. As I park my truck, my eyes fixate on a rundown building in the distance. The shadows it casts blend with the darkness of the night. I step out of the truck, stretching my legs before crossing my arms and leaning against the vehicle. A sudden scream pierces through the stillness of the night, bone-chilling and soaked in terror. With horror surging through me, I scramble back into my truck, locking the doors before rummaging through my glove box to grab a tire iron, my only means of defense. I strain my ears, hoping to hear something that could determine whether I should intervene or make a break for it. Somewhere in that eerie distance where shadows blur between trees, I see a tall figure dragging what seems like lifeless limbs. My stomach clenches as bow rises in my throat at this gruesome sight. Slug-like sweat drips down my neck as a decision weighs heavily on me. I stuff keys into the ignition and jab them with trembling fingers. But too late. The figure emerges from the shadows, nearing our encounter. The figure draws closer, each step deliberate and menacing. I fumble with my phone, intending to call for help, but the weak and sporadic signal mocks me, rendering it useless. Clutching the tire iron tightly, I take a deep breath and brace myself for the confrontation that lies ahead. I hastily open the driver's side door and edge out of my truck. The figure pauses 
seeming to consider me an inconsequential challenge. With sheer determination, I charged towards the mysterious figure, tire iron raised high, ready to strike. Our scuffle is brief yet brutal. Despite my best efforts, it is quickly apparent that the antagonist possesses exceptional strength and cunning. With great effort and sheer desperation, I managed to land a single powerful blow on the attacker's shoulder before he retaliates. A solid punch sends me reeling back, pain blurring my vision, as I crash into the gravel beside my truck. Pinned down beneath his repulsive gaze, I know that I am in grave danger. The attacker seems to savor this moment before abruptly turning away from me. With a renewed sense of urgency, the antagonist drags his battered victims into the desolated building nearby leaving me bloodied but alive. More terrified than ever, I crawl back into my truck and frantically try to gain control of my trembling limbs. Gathering all my remaining strength, I drive at breakneck speed from the scene and towards town. Upon reaching civilization, I immediately seek assistance. Local authorities swarm the gas station where Jason and I had spoken earlier that night. After a frantic discussion filled with horrifying details of how this cruel being mutilates his victims with meticulous precision, we share our newfound knowledge of his whereabouts. An intense manhunt ensues, involving teams of investigators who methodically work their way through evidence left by recent attacks. Ultimately, they are led to an unforgettable discovery a storage unit filled with sickening documentation of the antagonist's heinous crimes. His name, Adam Denton, is emblazoned across the lease agreement as still current and active. While analyzing the nefarious man's belongings and piecing together his twisted motives, I felt a pang of guilt for not doing more to save his victims earlier that night. The fallout from the investigation envelopes the small town in unease that leaves even the most hardened law enforcement officials shaken to their core. Despite extensive searches and relentless manhunts, Adam Denton remains elusive. He slips through the fingers of law enforcement, continuing to leave whispers of chaos and terror in his wake. As my truck takes me down another unfamiliar road, I cannot dispel memories of those frantically wavering shadows and cries for help that still haunt my dreams. And with each new town and each new horizon, I am constantly reminded that this monstrous being is still out there, lurking just beyond sight. Sleep no longer offers solace or reprieve from my haunting memories, but rather binds me in place with fear. The unanswered questions plagued my thoughts as I continued to drive on into the night, ever vigilant of the hidden horrors that could be lurking just around every bend. And so I move forward, doing what I can to protect those around me from this malevolent force. But as the sun dips below the horizon and darkness swallows up all the warmth of daylight once more, a lingering doubt gnaws at me. Will we ever truly be safe again? My name is Simon Carter, and if you told me I'd be belly deep in terror during my truck driving route, I would have laughed it off like a bad joke. It just goes to show that life truly takes unexpected turns. I worked the late shift that night, delivering furniture to a warehouse outside of Dayton, Ohio. The local radio station played a mix of classic rock and oldies, which made the long drives much more bearable. As I drove along Route 48, my headlights illuminated something disturbing just off the road. There were peculiar markings on a nearby tree trunk, with what appeared to be blood smeared across the bark. It looked as if someone had attempted to write some message or symbol that was getting interrupted every other stroke. 
My gut was telling me this wasn't some local kid's idea of a prank. It sent a chill up my spine. At least they didn't try spelling red rum. How cliche would that be? I muttered aloud in an attempt to bring some levity to the situation. I continued on my journey, trying not to dwell on the unsettling sight. As I was closing in on my destination, an industrial complex near the outskirts of Dayton, I came across what looked like an abandoned car by the side of the road. Desperate pleas for help rang out from inside the vehicle. My heart raced as I checked on the stranded motorist, who turned out to be Anna Thompson, an offbeat college student with an interest in geocaching and impressionist painting. Her car had broken down, and she had no cell reception in this remote area. Hey there! Do you need a hand? I asked as I approached her vehicle cautiously. What took you so long? Anna half-jokingly exclaimed in relief. It wasn't long before Anna was in my truck's passenger seat while we searched for any sign of a mechanic shop. We exchanged friendly banter for a while, laughing about shared pet peeves and the absurdity of pineapple pizza. Eventually, our conversation took a dark turn. I saw something back on Route 48 that made my skin crawl. I confided. I can't shake the feeling that we're not alone out here. Anna confessed to a similar nagging sense of dread and unease. Up ahead, the road twisted through a claustrophobic tunnel. Anna stiffened in her seat as we entered the darkness. It felt like an all-consuming void that threatened to consume whatever hope resided inside us. As we made our way out of the tunnel, a figure stood ominously at the exit. It appeared to be covered head to toe in dark clothing and had unnervingly elongated limbs. An unsettling smile stretched wide across its face, revealing rows of sharp teeth. I slammed on the brakes, barely managing to stop mere inches from the figure. It merely continued smiling as it took slow and deliberate steps toward my truck. The atmosphere in the truck shifted from casual camaraderie to sheer primal fear. With trembling hands, I locked all doors and rolled up any open windows. What is that thing? Anna cried desperately as we both stared, paralyzed by its deliberate approach. Stay in the car! I instructed urgently before grabbing a tire iron from under my seat. The figure seemed unfazed by my defensive stance as it continued advancing toward my truck. As it raised one of its abnormally long arms, potential weapons seemingly materialized into its grasp, a rusty knife, broken beer bottles. The figure's grotesque grin widened with each item appearing in hand. As the figure drew closer, I knew that I had to act quickly. I tossed the tire iron between my hands and rapidly analyzed the situation, knowing that we needed something even more effective to defend ourselves. Anna, look for something heavy and sturdy. I commanded, my voice trembling with urgency. We needed all the help we could get. She grabbed a large flashlight from the glove compartment and nodded affirmatively. Taking a deep breath and leaning against the door for leverage, I flung open my door, brandishing the tire iron in one hand while Anna mirrored my actions with her flashlight. The figure paused in its tracks, seemingly sizing us up before continuing its slow advance. A thick liquid oozed from its possessions like ink, staining the pavement beneath it. The air was thick with tension as we stood our ground. Just as it seemed like there was no hope for us, another vehicle's headlights suddenly appeared in the distance. The figure twitched violently before dissolving into black smoke and disappearing into the night. We seized this opportunity to make a run for it, sprinting toward the oncoming car like our lives depended on it, because they did. As we flagged down the driver of a pickup truck, 
He lowered his window with concern etched across his face. Christina? Simon Carter? He asked hesitantly, clutching a newspaper in his free hand. None other than Jake Harlan, an investigative journalist, had found us out here. He'd recognized both Anna and me from missing persons posters plastered across town over the past few days. Now that he'd found us, he turned his attention to our ghastly pursuer. Through careful research, he discovered that it was one Paul Hasten, who vanished along Route 48 himself years ago after a dark encounter near that very same tunnel altered him into something far more sinister and dangerous than anyone could have predicted. Though he was now a monstrous, disfigured man with unfathomable powers, his reason for targeting us remained unclear. As Jake filled us in on the details of Hasten's identity and origin, Anna and I wondered if the end was near. Our hearts surged with gratitude toward this unexpected ally, making a silent pact that we never forget the victims who came before us, including Christina Settler, whose name had become an eerie symbol of Hasten's cruelty. We all knew that simply driving away in Jake's car wouldn't be enough. Hasten would inevitably resurface to seek revenge. After much debate, we decided that our best course of action would be to lay low in a secluded town far from Route 48. As we sped away from the horrors we narrowly escaped, I couldn't help but glance back at the tunnel, now enveloped in darkness once more. The unknown terror that lay behind those walls haunted me with each passing moment. Our lives would never be the same after this encounter with evil's true face. For now, though, we pressed forward into the night, guided by hope and clinging desperately to newfound bonds forged through fear itself. And though Paul Hasten remained at large, out there somewhere, lurking in that wretched tunnel on Route 48, we knew that our story wasn't over yet. It was merely the beginning of a horrifying new chapter, fueled by vengeance and terror. As I unlocked the driver's side door of my truck, a breeze seemed to whisper through the parking lot of the isolated gas station near Littleton, Colorado. Being a truck driver named Roger Sims had its ups and downs, but one key to keeping my sanity on long hauls was having a good sense of humor. I chuckled to myself, thinking about the time I tried to convince a waitress that I didn't drink coffee purely because I was scared of unicorns. I climbed into the cab and looked around, making sure everything was in order before hitting the road again. The solitude this gas station provided was both a blessing and a curse, a brief respite from the monotony of driving but an eerie reminder that danger could lurk unseen. At that moment, I noticed something on my passenger seat, a crumpled piece of paper with writing on it. Strange, I hadn't put it there. Curiosity peaked. I unfolded it and read, Look behind you. My heart raced as I glanced at the rearview mirror, only to find shadows stretching across the parking lot. Was this a prank? As my pulse quickened, so did my need for answers. Scanning the area more intensely now, I spotted an old payphone against the wall its once bright red exterior now murky with age. With shaky hands clutching the paper, I exited my vehicle and went directly to the payphone. My thoughts were flooded with anger, unease, and confusion. Someone must be playing a sick joke on me. That's when I spotted her, hunched over in pain near the side of the building by a dumpster, was Clarice Stonemeyer, John Stonemeyer's wife. The Stone Myers were fellow trucking professionals who had helped me get started long ago. She looked pale and disoriented, her clothes covered in thick dark stains. Clarice! 
I exclaimed, rushing over and putting a hand on her shoulder. What happened? Her swollen eyes lifted to meet mine, glistening with tears. John! Someone took him. They told me to call you here, but I don't know what they want. Fear clenched my insides like an icy vice, adrenaline surging through my veins. Before I could utter a response, the sound of screeching tires filled the air, and we turned to see a black van speed away from us. In that instant, I understood. We were victims, trapped in this unexpected nightmare playing out in front of us. The shadows around us continued to grow darker as the sun dipped lower on the horizon. Grabbing Clarice, we stumbled back toward my truck cab when we heard it, a gut-wrenching scream, followed by chilling laughter echoing across the lot. Panic rose within me, a primal urge pushing me to find the source of these sickening sounds before it was too late. I told Clarice to stay behind while I searched for answers. We couldn't both risk our lives. We exchanged desperate looks and nods before parting. Praying for fortitude, I ventured into the abyss of darkness where no one dared to tread. As I moved further into the shadows, my senses heightened, listening intently to everything around me. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of movement near a row of abandoned vehicles in the distance, something eerily menacing. I cautiously approached for a closer look, hoping not to alert whatever or whoever was obscured by darkness. But as I crept closer, reality set in with horrifying clarity. Grotesque organs were splayed amongst twisted metal and shattered glass, the remains of John Stonemeyer. Staring at the grisly scene, my mind raced for a plan of action. What kind of sick individual could do this? Who would want to inflict such suffering on people I considered close friends? The urgency of their situation weighed heavily on my heart as I considered the implications of remaining in this place any longer. Clarice still needed help, and we had to get out of there. As my training kicked in, I took out my phone to call the police and keep them informed of our whereabouts. Their response time might not be swift but it was better than not having any help at all. After dialing the number, I suddenly remembered the black van that sped off earlier. Not wanting to alert the potential antagonists that we were onto their trail and getting authorities involved, I hung up before the call connected. If they were somehow watching us, calling for help might put us in more danger or provoke more horrific acts. With no time left for contemplation, I sprinted back to where I left Clarice hiding near the truck cab. Her teary eyes searched for information as she asked about John. He didn't make it, was all I could say while avoiding a graphic recount of what had unfolded. Together, we formulated a plan to arm ourselves as best as possible and gather some bits of evidence from the scene without further disturbing it. Perhaps some footprints or stray materials could lead us closer to who was truly behind this horror. As we examined the area near John's mutilated remains and gathered any pertinent information, we noticed an abandoned smartphone nearby, most likely Johnny's. Although cracked from the impact with pavement or other forces applied during his grisly murder, its contents might be our best chance of tracking down his killer. We salvaged what information we could from its unlocked interface, notably recently called numbers and text messages exchanged with unknown individuals displaying odd and sinister intentions. Attempting to decipher meaning from the fragmented messages, we noticed a repeated name. Walter. With nothing else to go on, we surmised that Walter must be the one we were hunting, but admittingly we had little to work with for a definitive conclusion just yet. Armed with the limited information from John's phone, and fear fueling our determination, we silently vowed to bring these brutal criminals to justice.
both as fellow trucking professionals and for John's memory. We spent the next few days meticulously analyzing every lead, from following trails of phone calls and text messages to investigating remote areas where the murderers might strike next. However, despite our best efforts, it seemed Walter was elusive as a ghost. The only constant among our findings was that he was incredibly dangerous and intelligent, always staying a step ahead of us. A few days passed with no sightings or encounters with Walter nor his associates. The tension in the air was palpable as uncertainty about the future loomed over us like an ominous cloud. As Clarice and I prepared to leave yet another crime scene without concrete answers, we received an anonymous text message. I'm watching. You cannot stop me. Chills ran through us upon reading those taunting words. It seemed Walter was aware of our investigation. Would Walter come for us now? We had no way of knowing. However, we knew we could not let fear paralyze us into submission. We would continue searching diligently, no matter how close danger lurked nearby. But as night fell and darkness threatened to envelope any hope for resolve, I couldn't help but wonder if we were making progress on this grim investigation or just drifting deeper into a world from which there would be no escape. My name is Hudson Reeves, a truck driver with a heavy heart and an expensive wedding to pay for. Although the job offered long hours on the road and a silent lull between radio frequencies, it met most of my financial needs, so I pushed forward with determination. It wasn't until the day of my brush with death that I paid more attention to those little moments in life we often ignore. As I set out on another overnight delivery, driving through the picturesque landscapes of Ohio, I reveled in the beauty that surrounded me. Occasionally, I joked with fellow truckers on the CB radio to pass the time, sharing anecdotes about our lives we would forget when our wheels stopped spinning. A light rain tapped against my windshield as darkness seeped into the sky. Pulling over for a coffee break at a rundown truck stop, I noticed something unusual near the fuel pumps. A macabre piece of art laid out in an almost haphazard way, black, spindly lines dripping down the pavement like some kind of decrepit canvas. It became clear that this was no ordinary work of vandalism. It resembled something much more sinister, human blood. Alarmed by my unexpected discovery, panic gripped me. Instead of fleeing back to my truck, I confided in one of the workers to mop up nearby spills. He furrowed his brow as if hiding something or unwilling to share important information. I wouldn't worry yourself with that, he mumbled unconvincingly. Contrary to his advice, I couldn't shake off what I'd stumbled across. Unease sank its icy fingers into me as my grip tightened around the wheel. Every gas station passed, and every honking car left me jumpy, nerves on edge. During one particularly dark stretch of road void of streetlights with trees creating a shadowy tunnel overhead, it happened. Headlights appeared behind me out of nowhere, blinding, shining through my rain-speckled mirrors. Heavy thuds echoed through the air as they collided with the back of my truck. It felt like a menacing force connected with each collision, sending cold shivers throughout my body. Pressing down on the accelerator, I tried to outrun the driver. My hands quivered against the cool metal of the wheel, and my teeth gritted in determination. Our vehicles raced through twists and turns like two behemoths ready for an epic showdown. The car pursuing me appeared to be a relic from a bygone era, rusty and decrepit. My eyes flickered over its bulky frame in quick glances through rearview mirrors, 
terrified to meet the gaze of whoever drove it. In that moment of horror, I fumbled for my CB radio, desperate to share this nightmare with other truckers on the road. Surely, they'd come to my aid or offer solace in the face of impending doom. But no matter how hard I mashed down on buttons or how frequently I adjusted channels, there was never a response. It was then that I spotted a horrifying sight, the face of someone concealed behind layers of dirt and grime streaked across a cracked windshield. Their skin bore sallow hues that hung loosely from bony ridges like layers of melting wax. With no sign of stopping their brutal pursuit, only adrenaline propelled me forward, boundless waves flooding tighter into every awakened synapse with each mile past. Suddenly, feeling more courageous than before, I wrenched open my window and thrust out an arm holding my portable fire extinguisher, aiming it straight at their smudged windshield. But just as quickly as they appeared, they vanished behind a veil of white mist, evaporating into some distant realm beyond human comprehension. My frantic heartbeats slowed to a crawl. My breaths became shallow pants within my tightened chest, and wheels screeched against coarse pavement as I jerked the truck to a clumsy stop off the side of the road. With my heart still pounding, I took a few moments to gather my thoughts and figure out what to do next. I knew I needed help, so I decided to call the local police station. There had been a gruesome sighting at the gas station, and now someone was attacking me as I drove down a dark road. When I reached the police, I frantically told them my story. Initially, they were skeptical, but amid the distress in my voice, they agreed to investigate. I cautiously resumed driving while waiting for the officer's instructions. Suddenly, and without warning, there was a sharp bang in my truck's undercarriage. I pulled over once more and climbed down from my truck to inspect the damage. As I knelt under the truck with a flashlight, something struck me from behind. The force of the blow caused me to drop my flashlight and become disoriented in the darkness. By the time I managed to steady myself and blindly crawl back towards where I had dropped my flashlight, another painful thud connected with my back. In terror, I stumbled away from the truck patching together, knowing that this attacker must have followed me. Desperately, I tried to call for help on my CB radio again, which remained dead silent. The sound of tortured metal screeching drew my attention just in time to see the hood of my truck being violently mutilated by the attacker. In sheer panic, I screamed for help, praying someone would hear me. Luckily for me, two other truckers that had been driving some distance behind us caught up and witnessed what was happening. They stopped their trucks and ran towards me with tire irons and crowbars in hand. Together, we fought ferociously against our seemingly supernatural attacker. But soon enough, we noticed it wasn't just one person but rather three different men who were relentless and methodical in their attacks. We fended off these crazed men until they abruptly retreated into the darkness. Gasping for breath, we took a closer look at the havoc they wreaked. Our trucks were damaged, and we all bore marks of assault. Later that day at the station, we found out that these men were part of a sadistic, violent gang known as the Rippers. They were notorious for using knives and blunt objects to terrorize truck drivers, dismembering people in some cases. The police had been searching for them for months, but no one had survived an encounter with them long enough to provide a proper description. We had collectively managed to unmask our attackers' identities and motives, yet they remained at large, unfazed by the police force's efforts. As my life returned to some semblance of normalcy, I couldn't help but wonder what happened to those three men.
The Rippers continued to commit their gruesome acts without ever being caught or killed. All I could do was hope that someday the innocent lives lost at their hands would find justice and peace as I went on with my life, forever scarred by that chilling experience. However, with each passing night on the road, shadows lurking along dark stretches haunted me, always recalling back to that eerie encounter. How? Why? Would remain questions swirling through my conscience for years to come. It was one of those evenings when the streetlights gleamed with a hazy aura, casting their dim glow over the city. My name is Russell Mantor, and I've been a truck driver for about 15 years. Generally, my days are long and filled with the monotonous grind of covering miles upon miles of asphalt. The only things keeping me going through dark and stormy nights or painfully sunny afternoons were my love for the open road and my twisted sense of humor. The story I'm about to share took place in Dayton, Ohio, where I had just finished delivering a shipment of car parts. Setting out on the road again, I pulled into a dingy truck stop to grab some food and coffee before continuing my journey. There was something strange in the air that evening. Maybe it was the garish flickering neon or perhaps the subtly unnatural absence of people in a usually bustling spot. Instead of dwelling on it, I decided to just be grateful for some quiet time. While paying for my purchases at the register, I made an off-color remark to the attendant behind the counter about how creepy things were at this truck stop. Oh yeah! He nervously chuckled, almost like he was trying to force a sense of normalcy into our conversation. Dayton has always been known to attract its fair share of odd folks. After finishing my transaction, I took my supplies and headed back to my truck. That's when I saw it, nestled between two big rigs, a man wearing a stained white shirt and ragged jeans. What caught my attention was his insane grin, the gesture contorting his face into something grotesque, and his wild, staring eyes that seemed glued onto mine. My insides writhed as instinct told me that this person wasn't quite right. Shaking off that gut feeling, fear biting at me but unresolved tension pushing me forward, I asked the stranger, Hey there, buddy. You all right? No response. He just kept grinning and staring, a vacant yet unnerving gaze that sent a chill running through me. I didn't want to appear rude, but something deep down was telling me to get back into my truck and put that truck stop in the rearview mirror as quickly as possible. I nerved myself and hastily climbed back into my cab, not bothering to say another word to the man. For a moment, I doubted my instincts. Why was I so afraid of this guy? What harm could he cause? Little did I know that the events that followed would forever be burned into my memories. The next few hours went by without incident. I even started to relax, convincing myself it had just been a figment of my imagination or a function of city fatigue. My confidence was shattered when I caught sight of the same man in my rearview mirror on the lonely stretch of highway. There he was again, grinning ear to ear, following me. My heart raced in pure terror. As the hooded figure moved closer, each curve and turn felt like a nightmare as he followed closely behind. Unexpectedly turning his stance erratic, darting first left, then right and almost frothing at the mouth with each lunging motion, my sense of dread escalated. As I continued driving, I contemplated calling the police to report the man who kept following me. But then, not wanting to appear foolish for overreacting, she decided against it. Instead, I pulled over at a nearby rest area and hoped the man would just pass by and leave me alone. 
The place was nearly deserted, with only a few cars parked under the dim lights. Exiting my truck, I locked the doors and proceeded to skin my surroundings carefully. To my relief, the man seemed to have vanished into thin air. However, I still couldn't shake off that nagging feeling of being watched. Walking towards the restroom building with cautious steps, I suddenly tripped over something. Looking down, surrounded by pools of blood and grotesquely dismembered bodies scattered around me like a macabre art piece. Frozen in shock at the gruesome scene, I frantically looked around for anyone else, or any clues as to what had happened. That's when two other truckers came stumbling out of the employee lounge, their faces contorted with fear. We exchanged our stories, all of us having encountered the creepy man, and deduced that he must be responsible for these seemingly random acts of violence. His name was Edward Linton, as revealed by one of their CB radios earlier, a notorious serial killer who had been on the run for months. The three of us decided we needed to warn others and call the police, despite our initial beliefs that we would be laughed at. Quickly heading back to my truck, we heard loud growling noises emanating from behind us. An overwhelming dread washed over all of us as we realized Linton was back, lurking within close proximity. We picked up speed in an attempt to escape him. Before we could reach my truck, though, Linton emerged from behind an old, rusty trailer, his scarred face twisted into an even more malicious grin than before. With lightning speed and unnerving accuracy, Linton killed the two truckers using a long, jagged knife that easily tore through their flesh-like wet tissue. Their screams were cut short as their throats gushed out crimson streams before they collapsed to the ground. The unimaginable sight of their deaths right in front of me forced spurts of adrenaline through my veins, and I knew I couldn't just stand there any longer. Ignoring the voice in my head that told me it was futile, I mustered all my strength and swung a tire iron directly at Linton with as much force as possible. My attack didn't faze him, but only hampered his stride ever so slightly, enough for me to dash into my truck and lock the doors. With trembling hands gripping the steering wheel, I rammed into gear and sped off as far away from the rest area as possible, not caring what would happen or where I would end up. The engine roared, and Linton, merely watching from that rest area, receded in the rearview mirror. Eventually, I found a secluded spot where I parked and hid in complete silence for hours. As morning light slowly crept across the sky, police sirens echoed in the distance, ensuring some form of safety. But even after hours of recounting my story, with every detail seared into my mind for eternity, there was no doubt about Linton's atrocities. I knew they would never find him. He had left haunting memories with every victim, including myself, but somehow knew how to evade law enforcement. Though he left no sign of an amulet or rituals, it felt like he carried an unearthly power that seemed to protect him from being captured or killed. And now, I sit here recounting this chilling tale of Edward Linton, grateful to be alive but perpetually tormented by what might have been if not for that desperate last attempt to fend him off. And with every truck stop or deserted highway, a shiver runs down my spine, knowing that he may still be out there, and could be anywhere. I was easing into my third year as a truck driver when it happened. I got assigned to pick up a heavy shipment from a warehouse in Edgar, Nebraska, and deliver it across state lines by dawn the next day. My name is Clayton Bowser, and I'd been driving big rigs for years, seeing everything from roadkill to reckless drivers in my time. 
but nothing prepared me for the harrowing encounter in that town. The trip started out smooth as silk until I reached Eddington Gas Station, about twenty minutes away from the warehouse. While I was pumping gas into my rig, a man with long and frizzy hair approached me. He seemed like a local and asked me if I could lend him some cash for food. Sorry, pal. I chuckled nervously. I'm spending all my gas money right here. That's when I noticed his eyes. They were bright blue but almost unnaturally wide. Owing to my gut feeling about this man, I quickly finished pumping gas and drove off toward the warehouse. When I reached the warehouse, it had already begun its slow descent into darkness. The sun set first, painting orange streaks across the cloud-heavy sky as lamps flickered on one by one. The hum of fluorescent lights filled the air as employees bustled around, preparing their truck loads. I signed some paperwork and soon backed my rig up to the loading bay. As workers began loading pallets onto my truck, an uneasy feeling crept over me. I glanced around and then noticed the chilling sight. That man from the gas station was standing just beyond the fence surrounding the property. He wasn't approaching anyone or doing anything too creepy. He just stood there, gazing intently at what was happening. My instincts urged me to call security or inform someone about this man's suspicious appearance near the warehouse, but when our eyes met again through that fence, his piercing gaze rooted me in place. I pretended I didn't see him, climbed back into my rig, and slammed the door. The next five hours were filled with anxiety and anticipation. My grip tightened on the wheel and I felt my jaw go tense every time I glanced into the rearview mirror. Unfortunately, bad weather moved in, dressing the landscape in sheets of rain that fell with increasing fury. Many exits and turns later, illuminated by frequent flashes of lightning, I was stopped at a red traffic light in a seemingly deserted area. As streams of water raced down the windshield, my mind wandered over what seemed like hundreds of possibilities involving that man from Edgar. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him sludging through heavy rain toward the driver's side door of my truck. Terrified, I attempted to call for help but realized there was no cell reception here. Out of options, I gunned it through the now green light and maneuvered with all my might, trying to lose him. Taking sudden hairpin bends on abandoned streets and breaking all regulations in an effort to escape my pursuer, for several minutes sheer adrenaline kept me going. An unexpected flash flood at an intersection forced me to stop abruptly. My heart pounded fiercely as a bone-chilling scream echoed through the relentless rainfall outside. A figure emerged in front of my truck a limping female drenched in both rain and blood. She cried for help while desperately holding her mangled arm. As she stumbled toward me, he reappeared from deep within the deluge. That wide-eyed man from before wielding a massive meat cleaver too gruesome for words. The terror-stricken woman seemed to recognize him and rushed toward my rig as tears mixed with rain streamed down her face. In an instant, I unlocked the passenger side door, allowing the injured woman to clamber into the cab of my rig. No sooner than she'd slammed the door shut did the man with the cleaver make contact, slashing through the air where her body had been just moments before. Her eyes brimmed with terror as I tromped on the gas, tearing away from the flooded intersection and our ghastly pursuer. We drove in silence as I tried to steady my breathing and focus on the road. The woman tended to her mangled arm, using a rag from my glove compartment to wrap it tightly. Though she was clearly in pain and shock, she mustered the strength to whisper a thank you. What's your name? I asked her hesitantly. Audrey, she replied weakly. All right, Audrey. 
We need to call for help. I dialed 911 only to find that there was still no cell reception. Desperation and frustration swelled within me. We were trapped with no way out and seemingly no way to alert others of our peril. Forget it, Audrey said. He's always one step ahead. A chilling realization clicked in my mind. This man must have planted a signal jammer somewhere nearby. Having dealt with electronic components for most of my career, this notion seemed more plausible than anything else that entered my thoughts. As we reached a clearing away from flooded streets, we spotted a small police station on our route. It seemed miraculous and convenient at once. Feeling hopeful for perhaps the first time since this nightmare began, we pulled up outside. Audrey rushed inside, gory arm and all. Seeing her disheveled state and sensing our urgency, an officer approached us immediately and led us to Sergeant Palmer. As we recounted our ordeal with shaky voices, Palmer typed away on his computer system, attempting to locate information about our attacker. Moments later, his face tensed. I think I know who you're dealing with, he said hesitantly. His name is Ivan Bracken. He's been linked to mutilations and murders in the past. Some say he's been looking for his next victims for two years. Palmer ordered back up instantly and sent a team to track down Bracken. As we expressed our willingness to help in any way we could, Palmer advised that we stay put while the authorities handled the situation. He reassured us that it was the safest thing to do. Hours passed as we sat in that police station, but it felt like days. Our spirits soared when a report came in saying the team had discovered Bracken's hideout, an abandoned house just outside of town, its walls plastered with clippings about his previous victims. As uniformed officers swarmed the building seeking retribution, we were escorted away from the scene and told they'd inform us once it was safe. Despite their victory against Bracken's wretched hideout, an unsettling truth lingered. They still hadn't succeeded in capturing or killing him. It became clear that our nightmare was far from over. With every twist, turn, and drop of blood, I continued transporting that heavy shipment throughout my remaining days as a truck driver, always wary of who might be lurking just beyond the horizon. The memory of Ivan Bracken still haunts me and likely will for many nights to come. Would he reappear when we least expected it? Would our fates become part of his long-lasting legacy? Though these questions remained unanswered, one certainty persisted. Ivan Bracken's reign was not yet over. And somehow, I knew either Audrey nor I would ever truly escape his grisly grip. It all began on an overcast afternoon at a desolate truck stop in Gallup, New Mexico. My name's Ernest Jansen, and as a truck driver, I've been hitting the road for years. Gallup was just another pit stop on my route across the states, but that day felt different. As I filled up my rig, I couldn't help but chuckle to myself over a crude joke I'd heard earlier in the day. It was foul, unexpected humor that would make anyone laugh or groan, just the way I liked it. I'd made it halfway across the parking lot to take a break when I stumbled upon a grisly scene, a woman lying face down in her own blood. Horror washed over me as I realized her limbs were grotesquely twisted, and her long, stained white dress barely covered her mutilated flesh. This couldn't possibly be happening in broad daylight on an otherwise ordinary day. I stammered and fumbled with my phone to dial 911. To my dismay, my shaky hands found no signal. No freaking signal? What am I supposed to do? 
I whispered hoarsely to myself. A moment later, a man staggered into view from behind an abandoned trailer nearby. Clutching his arm clearly in pain, his face contorted with agony. His clothes were disheveled and smeared with dirt. He was barely recognizable from a distance. Please, he help! He croaked and dropped to his knees. My first instinct was to run over to him and try to offer help, but then something caught my eye. A tall man wearing filthy rags appeared behind him with unnerving haste. The ragged man's face was covered in shadow, making it impossible for me to glean his features. His hands were oddly stained with dark liquid as they gripped something metallic and sinister-looking. Without warning or hesitation, the scarred stranger bludgeoned the wounded man, striking him repeatedly with chilling precision. I felt my heart leaping into my throat as the bile rose in my mouth. I couldn't move as horror paralyzed me, pinned in place by dread that I was next. As the stranger, a demented artist, continued to beat his victim, I tried to memorize his size and any other features I could make out. It was my only hope if he noticed me and came for me too. I had no context for this man not knowing if he killed purely for sport or as some type of twisted vigilante. I forced my trembling hands to work the phone again, frantically pawing at it to find even one bar of signal. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, I managed a foothold on connectivity and reached out for help. The line connected. The response? A busy signal. This can't be happening. I murmured as everything felt surreal. In a moment of desperation, I considered employing my own means of self-defense. However, that quickly felt ludicrous given both my powerlessness against this man-man and the fact that I had no idea who or what he was capable of doing. Seeing that the stranger was momentarily occupied with his latest victim, I found my feet propelled backward, away from their dance macabre and into the safety of my rig. Tires squealed against asphalt as I hastily threw the truck into gear and sped away. Frequent glances in my rearview mirror did little to reassure me that he wasn't following close behind. That demented man haunted every turn of my route. Even a fleeting glance at another truck stop would send shivers down my spine. A relentless whisper gnawed at me with each mile traversed. Why didn't anyone answer? Was it possible he'd already done something to the emergency responders in Gallup? And if that were true, had anyone reached them on time? Gritting my teeth, I continued driving into the night, the truck growling with each turn. I dread to think about the stranger out there, and whether or not that chilling moment would return, and my nightmare would collide with reality once more. The following days were filled with tension as I secretly obsessed over every detail of my encounter with the gory assailant. I couldn't bear to confide in anyone, and each moment alone only served to heighten my paranoia. Even though I had managed to put some distance between Gallup and myself, the lingering reminders of the mysterious man left me feeling vulnerable and trapped. What if I was still on his radar? Desperate for answers, I reached out to an old trucker friend, Jack. After I explained everything that happened, Jack suggested we meet somewhere discreet. We decided to rendezvous at a small town diner nearly fifty miles away from Gallup. As we sat facing each other, our eyes hidden behind sunglasses, I showed Jack pictures of the crime scene that I managed to take on my phone. His face went pale, and he asked me if I had seen the man responsible for the grisly act. I told him everything about the stranger's appearance including his uncanny speed and how he wielded that sinister metallic weapon. Jack leaned closer to me, his face grim with sincerity. 
I believe this isn't the first time this guy struck. People call him Bloody Clark because every victim is found drenched in blood, or what's left of them, he said softly. The man had already killed countless people across multiple states and showed no signs of stopping. I shared my concerns about calling for help again since my last attempt didn't go through. It may be impossible for anyone to successfully call 911 without risking their life or suffering repercussions from Bloody Clark himself. Jack pressed me not to involve the police, not necessarily out of fear but because some believed that this man-man had infiltrated authority figures at certain levels the police force included. We vowed that we'd do whatever it took to protect each other from Bloody Clark and continue our search for any leads about his origins. For now, we'd keep everything we knew to ourselves, acting as though life carried on as usual. Days later, a foreboding fog had settled in. The musty air clung to my skin as I made my way back to my rig after another long shift on the road. The very air seemed to choke me, and I gasped for breath while fumbling with the keys. My attention was caught by rustling bushes nearby. Someone or something was there, lurking, waiting. My chest heaved as I desperately hoped that it wasn't Bloody Clark closing in on me. I wished more than ever that I could go back in time to warn those unfortunate souls who crossed paths with him sending them running and possibly changing the course of history for the better. But reality wasn't that simple or forgiving. As I stepped into my truck, I looked into the rearview mirror and saw Bloody Clark standing several feet away, with that same chillingly blank gaze, both undeniably human and unnatural at the same time. I slammed the gas pedal, determined not to let him catch me again, or continue his bloodbath uncontested. And then I remembered, he wasn't just an ominous figure from Gallup. He was now part of my existence, inescapable and eternal. He'd haunt me no matter where I went or how far I tried to flee. The unnerving thought loomed over me like a grim shadow as the fog began to settle heavily once more. We might never be free from Bloody Clark's grasp.